Okay, sergeants, if you would begin your recordings. Uh, PC recording is underway. According to the cloud, all set. Mr. Katowski. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Youth Services. At this time, would council staff please turn on their video. Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you. Chair, we are ready to begin. Uh, Chair, you're still muted. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today on this very important sub issue. I'd like to start by reading my opening statement. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fiscal 2022 preliminary budget oversight hearing for the Department of Youth and Community Development. I am Council Member Debbie Rose, the chair of the, the Committee on Youth Services, and I am pleased to be joined by my fellow council members, um, Margaret Chin. Um, I don't have the list in front of me. Um, I think it's Margaret Chin at this moment. Uh, we will hear today from DYCD Commissioner Bill Chung, financial, Chief Financial Officer Jadine Fenor, along with the agency's team a program specific deputy and assistant associate commissioners. Thank you all for joining us. I want to also welcome public advocate Jamani Williams to today's hearing. First and foremost, we are here to discuss DYCD's $745.3 million budget for fiscal year 2022. The preliminary budget includes one new need for the Learning Bridges program, totaling $57 million in fiscal year 2021. Other budget changes total a reduction of $5.3 million in fiscal year 2021 and fiscal year 2022, with cuts reducing the budget by $10.3 million in fiscal year 2021 and fiscal year 2022. Sadly, once again, as the chair of the Youth Services Committee, I have been served the preliminary budget that eliminates services to a critical segment of our youth population. This budget is notable for not what it includes, but what it does not include. The administration's decision to cut $5.7 million in support for a middle school summer programming under the Schools Out NYC program, or SONIC, will leave over 9,000 children without services this coming summer, leaving us once again shaking our heads as to why would the administration choose to leave out our most vulnerable population to fend for themselves, especially after suffering from the byproducts of the COVID-19 pandemic and being socially isolated for a year. Did we not learn any lessons from last year's uptick in teen suicides, violence, and depression? Why would DYCD arbitrarily choose to eliminate a baseline program that provided educational, recreational, and job development opportunities for youth who have suffered disproportionately from historic socioeconomic inequities? DYCD's mission is supposed to provide a gateway out of, out of poverty and to support youth and their families through youth and community development programs. Leading me to question why Compass and the Beacon and Cornerstone camps are fully funded, but not Sonic. Why would we not provide our youth this summer with programming that is meaningful, structured, educational, and a place to go where they are safe and supported? Last year was a historic year on so many levels. When the council tirelessly negotiated with the administration to restore funds back into the budget for SYEP, 
and summer camps so that the city's youth could have programming and jobs over the summer. I thought we wouldn't have to go through this again. We all learned what is needed and what is unacceptable. So to see the plan cut 5.7 million for one camp program seems penny wise, pound foolish, vindictive and punishing at this point, not only to us, but punishing to the 9,000 middle school children that need this program. When this administration began its term, we heard about the importance of protecting our 12 to 14 year olds from negative influences outside of their homes and schools. Yet year after year, we have to fight tirelessly to provide them with the programs that help combat these issues. The social emotional learning gaps that our students face have widened during the COVID-19 pandemic. The summer months are often an unstructured time for young people and a strain on parents who need supervised childcare so that they can work. The administration has never been a proponent of Summer Sonic. Our city leadership must see the real value of summer programs for teens and acknowledge that it is disingenuous for us as a city to continue this to suggest that this is a non-essential program and cut this baseline service. The program will never achieve its full potential when our service providers have less than three weeks to plan a summer program. They are notified in June of the sonic restorations and quickly attempt to secure buses for trips, program space, and to recruit children and staff this is essentially setting the program up for failure. Our program providers need the flexibility this summer as schools reopen. They need adequate notice and the executive budget must include the full summer sonic restoration. Last night, we had a great rally with the teens who participate and the teens who want the opportunity to participate in our sonic programs. And they very articulately and clearly made their case for restoration of sonic funding, summing it up by saying, show us the money. Hashtag fund youth NYC. Last year, our city and state recognized childcare as an essential public service in the efforts to cope with the COVID outbreak. DYCD launched the Learning Bridges program to provide care and enrichment for children in grades K through eight on remote learning days. The fiscal year 21 budget included $57 million for learning bridges. The program is expected to run until the end of the school year, June 30th, with no plans beyond that. As a legislative body representing 8.5 million New Yorkers and growing, it is our responsibility as a council to ensure that the city's budget is equitable, transparent, and accountable. That is why this committee continues to press the Office of Management and Budget, DYCD, and the mayor to add more services, not less, to add more SYEP slots, to baseline work, learn, grow, and to stop cutting summer sonic. The families across New York City rely on these indispensable lifeline programs, and it is my duty to ensure that the funding is there to execute these services. This committee will also review DYCD's performance for this year, as reported in the Fiscal 2021 Preliminary Mayor's Management Report, or the PMMR. Here, too, I believe we will have just as an interesting conversation about what is not included as much as about what is. The PMMR needs to be more transparent when contextualizing the data. It provides the data it provides as it is not inclusive of all programs and their data sets, nor provides budget program budget data. DYCD has been tasked with managing the preparation of the city's next generation of leaders to fulfill their potential. Programs like the Comprehensive After School System or COMPASS 
and the Summer Youth Employment Program, SYEP, are intended to help young New Yorkers rise to the next level. I myself am a product of SYEP, and my experiences from my first job have helped to make me who I am today. It is the goal of this committee to ensure that these programs are serving as many young people as possible. Our ultimate goal being universal SYEP. This is a bittersweet moment for me as this is my last preliminary budget hearing. It has been an honor to serve as chair of the Youth Services Committee. I am grateful for the work the committee has done to support youth in New York City. It is my hope that even in my absence, the city will continue to do the right thing by supporting our youth who are the most underrepresented and one of our most vulnerable populations in our city. It is our duty to enrich the minds of our youth, support their emotional and social well-being, and continue to provide meaningful work experiences that will support the many working and struggling families in our city. I look forward to a productive conversation today. But before we begin, I would like to take a moment to thank Issa Cortez, my budget director, Christine Johnson, my chief of staff, Christian Ravello, my legislative aide, Michelle Peregrine, the financial analyst to the committee, Isha Wright, the unit head, Amy Briggs, our counsel to the committee, our new council, welcome. And Anastasia Zamina, our policy analyst to the committee. Elizabeth Arts, our community engagement liaison. And I'd like to thank Commissioner Chong and Associate Commissioner uh, Fanor and the dedicated staff of DYCD for your longstanding commitment to the youth of New York City. And now Commissioner Chong and Associate Commissioner Fanor, our council will swear you in. Thank you, Chair Rose. Actually, I would like to invite um, public advocate Jamani Williams, who is here with us today, if he would like to provide his opening remarks as well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you uh, to Chair Rose. Uh, I just wanna say your, here, your presence here uh, just continues to show your undeniable dedication uh, to the young people of the city of New York. And so happy to see you and, and my prayers are still with you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, my name is Jamani Williams and I'm a public advocate for the city of New York. I'd like to again, thank Chair Debbie Rose and members of the Committee on Youth Services for holding this very important preliminary budget hearing and for allowing me to say a few uh, words. Last year, the COVID-19 pandemic brought the city into a budget crisis none of us could have anticipated. Programs and services had served severe funding cuts, one in particular being youth services. In the adopted budget last year, the Department of Youth and Community Development was allocated nearly $539.3 million. Fortunately, the administration adhered to the calls of youth advocates and put a plan in place to operate youth programs in a way that adjusted to our new temporary reality given the scope of the pandemic. At a hearing held by the Committee on Youth Services in January, Representatives from DYCD explained that in 2020, the Summer Bridge program admitted roughly 35,000 participants, less than half than the amount of young people enrolled in the program the year before. Although the mayor seeks to have the program reach its pre-COVID number of participants this year, I hope the number of participants will actually surpass that amount. In addition to taking, talking about the budget, we have to talk about operations. Young people need to be involved in the development process and rollout of this year's SYEP. Last year, over 100,000 of the young people who applied to the program never received a response. And in early August, many were uncertain as to whether or not the program was even underway. We cannot let the lack of organization happen again this year. That number is important because many people sometimes describe our young people as lazy and not wanting services. And here we have hundreds of thousands applying I expect DYCD to continue prioritizing the enrollment of young people from communities hit hardest by the coronavirus, as well as homeless youth, especially those who are members of the LGBTQ community. At the same hearing in January, agency representatives said that out of the 1,843 homeless youth who applied to SYP last year, only 873 ended up being enrolled in the program. 
We should aim to increase that number this summer as there are some of the most vulnerable members of our city's young population. The only way to ensure that the program accommodates more participants is to offer SYP placements that are in compliance with COVID-19 guidance, especially seeing as how we are on the path to increase vaccine distribution in the coming months. We need to make certain that there is sufficient amount of career development opportunities that align with public health standards for our young people. The Office of Management and Budget released its financial plan earlier this year, which showed the city's plan to allocate approximately $532.9 million to DYCD for fiscal year 2022. We need clarification as to how DYCD will execute its programming with this funding. The Summer Youth Employment Program is expected to receive nearly $131 million in funding in fiscal year 2022, which is supposed to provide for 70,000 spots in the program. It's also important to know which forms of outreach DYCD is implementing to reach communities most affected by COVID-19, which efforts are being put forth to increase admission into the Career First NYCHA program to expand access to career development opportunities for youth residing in NYCHA buildings and how much funding the agency will designate to the purchase of devices for remote placements this summer. Um, just going back to summer youth, uh, we know that that's not even how much it was at its peak. And uh, we know that 100,000 would be much closer to universal, uh, which is where we should be for summer youth employment program. Last year, DYCD was informed by NYCHA partners that 50% of their households were not connected to the internet or had Wi-Fi signal. Luckily, the agency managed to secure funding for partners at Young Men's Initiative and from other services sources to purchase more than 2,000 devices, including internet-ready tablets. I'm calling on DYC to set aside funding to provide more devices this year. Although services like SYP and in-school youth programs are expected to see a notable increase in funding, there are other programs uh, that are expected to see a decrease, like the Runaway and Homeless Youth Program, or RHY, and even the ones that are seeing an increase like SYP certainly not near where it should be. As I said before, our homeless youth are some of the most vulnerable members of our city's population. RHY has drop in centers, crisis services programs, transitional independent living programs, and street outreach and referral services. Uh, that population in particular has a high, uh, attend a high prevalence of young people from the LGBT community. The mayor should not be reduced, reducing funding for these essential services, even if it's just by 3.3% but rather increasing funding, especially during a pandemic. I wanna say that the term defund the police brings a lot of emotions out to the floor. Uh, and wherever you are on that, there's one thing that should be clear. The message that's being sent by decreasing or trying to decrease the preliminary budget for DYCD by almost 10% while increasing the budget of the NYPD from a starting point of 6.25% sends the wrong message. The administration needs to reconsider this budget decision, designate more funding toward programs like the ones being cut, not being funded enough by like DYC, uh, in the agency of DYCD. I look forward to hearing how DYCD will support youth services given administration's proposed budget for fiscal year 22. And I hope uh, that the commissioner I will this year be advocating for additional funding for these programs. Thank you. Thank you, public advocate, um, Jamani Williams for your remarks and for joining us this morning. And I wanna personally thank you for your fervent advocacy on behalf of our young people. Um, they can have a, a more active and vocal advocate. Um, and now I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us. Uh, we are. We have been joined by Council Member Chin, Council Member Rosenthal, um, and I will now turn it over to the committee's new council, Amy Briggs, who will review some procedural items relating to today's hearing and call on the first panel. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rose. Um, I am Amy Briggs, Committee Counsel for the Committee on Youth Services of the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called, you'll be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce who the next panelists are. Uh, 
Council members, questions will be limited to five minutes and council members, please note that this includes both your questions and the witness answers. Please also note that time permitting, we will allow a second round of questions at today's hearing. They will be limited to two minutes, again, including both your question and the witnesses answers. For public testimony, I will call up individuals in panels. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. You will be called on after everyone on that panel has com completed their testimony. For public panelists, once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking after setting the timer. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin. Um, for today's hearing, we will begin with testimony from the administration, followed by council member questions and then public testimony. Um, I will deliver the oath to all the administration that is present today. And after reading the oath, I will call up on call upon each of you to individually by name to respond to the oath at one at a time. So for the administration members we have online, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before these committees and respond and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Bill Chong. You would answer. I do or yes. Oh, are you still mute? Ted? You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. It popped up. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, Assistant Commission Commissioner Rong Cheng. Yes, I do. Thank you. Jagdeen Fenor. I do. Susan Haskell. I do. Thank you. Daryl Rattray. I do. Thank you. Randolph Scott. I do. Daphne Montanez. I do. Thank you. Tracy Cauldron. I do. Thank you. Uh, all right. Well, thank you, Commissioner Jong. You may begin your testimony when ready. Good morning, uh, Chair Rose. Public Advocate Williams and members of the Committee on Youth Services. I am Bill Chong, Commissioner of the Department of Youth and Community Development. As uh, Debbie Rose uh, mentioned, this is a bittersweet moment. This will be my last uh, preliminary budget hearing. I wanna take this opportunity to thank the uh, City Council for being a great partner over the last eight years and making sure that as many resources are available to my agency. I'm joined by Jadine Fenor, UICD's Chief Financial Officer, Susan Haskell, Deputy Commissioner for Youth Services, Dow Rattray, Associate Commissioner for Youth Services and Strategic Partnerships, Tracy Calderon, the uh, uh, Assistant Commissioner for the Compass Program, uh, Daphne Montanez, Assistant Commissioner for Workforce Development, Randolph Scott, Assistant Commissioner for uh, Vulnerable Youth, Runaway and uh, Runaway Homeless and Vulnerable Youth, Assistant uh, uh, Dana can tell me our agency chief contracting officer and Ron Zhang, assistant commissioner for literacy and immigrant services. We are grateful to have this opportunity to testify on DYCD's fiscal 2022 preliminary budget. I am incredibly proud of DYC staff, our providers, young people and families during the past challenging year. With COVID-19 and the city's worst economic crisis in 45 years, this was a year unlike any other. Going on pause due to the pandemic meant meeting our core responsibilities while teleworking. DYCD's IT team quickly had the agency up and running remotely and our staff didn't miss a beat. Services continued to be delivered in new ways. Virtual opportunities like DYCD at home, make, making sure that providers had contracts and were paid and fresh approaches to 
internal and external communications in terms of content, frequency, and delivery. Our outstanding network of community-based organizations answered the call by quickly reinventing themselves to administer remote programming and adapt to new initiatives such as learning bridges so that the New Yorkers have safe, so New Yorkers had a safe place to learn and receive services. USAD was able to serve 339,963 New Yorkers in fiscal 2020, an increase over the previous year. We continued to address the needs of vulnerable and homeless youth primarily through in-person programming and more available beds. Our Compass After School program served 122,575 young people and Beacon and Cornerstone Community Centers became lifelines by providing everything from remote activities to food and personal protective equipment. Tens of thousands of New Yorkers received support through literacy, immigrant services and anti-poverty programs. With our partnership and in close uh, collaboration with our providers we developed some SYP Summer Bridge, an, an engaging virtual program that offered young people opportunities to learn new skills, explore potential careers, and earn money. Online applications for the most programs are now available at Discover DYCD. And DYCD Connect has been greatly enhanced to help organizations communicate and coordinate with communities that they serve. These accomplishments are due in no small part to investments in streamlining and modernizing our systems. Last year, as part of the city's ongoing efforts to address the digital divide in underserved communities, Mayor de Blasio announced a new initiative to provide free high-speed con connectivity in public housing. DYCD and DOE, working with the Information Technology Disaster Resource Center, the Rockefeller Foundation, Zoom, CLO Scholarship Foundation and Education Superhighway will deliver Wi-Fi and broadband uh, upgrades at DYCD funded Cornerstone Community Centers. More than 12,000 young people and adults will benefit from the enhancements during active programming at the centers, in addition to the thousands of community members who can access the free Wi-Fi hotspots provided by ITDRC as a result of this partnership. We thank our partners for their support. The preliminary budget uh, for DYCD is in a strong position to continue the progress to prepare the city for a strong recovery. Despite the city's fiscal challenges, the primary budget preserves most baseline funding and programming, uh, a true testament of the de Blasio administration's commitment to the city's youngest people and families. It stands at 745.4 million, 533 million, uh, or 71.5% city tax levy, 9% is federal and 1% is state. We are pleased that the fiscal 2022 preliminary budget includes support and funding to, uh, for 70,000 jobs through the summer youth employment program. Working with our providers and health experts, our program will provide services in person, remotely or in a hybrid environment. This model will balance the needs of young people and their families and meet the needs of work sites as we move towards reopening our city. We appreciate application, we, we anticipate applications to open in mid-March. Uh, we thank the account, uh, council for your support and advocacy for SYP over the many years. Our other programs are also receiving baseline funding. Fiscal 2022 funding levels currently stand at 337 million for Compass programs, 559.5 uh, million for Beacons, and uh, 53.4 million for Cornerstone programs. The 44.5 uh, million to runaway and homeless youth services will support 813 beds, eight drop-in centers, and uh, out outreach, street outreach programs. These and other programs are essential in, in fostering a recovery for all of us. Thank you again for the chance to testify and we are ready to answer your questions. Thank you for your testimony. Before I turn to Chair Rose for questions, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate that they have a question for the panel. Uh, Chair Rose. Thank you. Thank you so much, council. Um, and thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. Uh, DYC has a total proposed budget of $745.3 million for fiscal year 2022. The fiscal 2022 preliminary budget for DYCD sees minimal changes. This plan sees a one-time, however, it sees a one-time cut 
to Summer Sonic in fiscal year 2022, totaling 5.7 million. Um, what are the alternative plans for middle school students this summer in the absence of, of this program funding? So let me say, I was uh, very disappointed to see that in the preliminary budget, but I think as the budget director said in his testimony, uh, when the budget was released in late January, there was a lot of things we didn't know. Most notably, uh, the scope uh, of support the city would receive in the American Rescue Plan. And as, as we're all excited that the president will sign it tomorrow, it's my hope that uh, we can talk about restoration of this uh, reduction. Uh, the uh, stimulus money that we were receiving uh, will help tremendously in looking at one stability in the FY22 budget and the flexibility to consider cuts that uh, were uh, taken un, uh, 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 because the situation looks, was pretty bleak in, uh, in late January. If you remember back then, the state was talking about billions and billions of, of cuts. So the city took a very cautious approach but now that I think I have a certain level of optimism with the uh, federal help on the way, and uh, you know, hopefully uh, with the council support, we can restore this cut. Um, I, I'm glad to hear that, uh, and um, is my hope that with the the increased aid from the federal government, that we might not only see an increase um, a restoration of the baseline amount but uh, we might be able to enhance that number so that we can serve um, upwards of more students than um, that we served previously. Uh, close to, um, we serve close to 30,000 um, students. Um, could you please tell the committee how much funding the plan includes for summer camps for Compass, Beacon, and Cornerstone programs? And, and what are each budgeted slots out and what are each budgeted slot allocations for each of these programs? So I will, um, as, as I said in my testimony, most of the baseline programs uh, maintain level going back to the earlier budget year before the pandemic. So I, I'll turn to Susan first and if she needs help, Judine can fill in the budget numbers, but. Susan probably knows these uh, summer camp numbers because she's been working on planning for summer from day one. So Susan? Yeah, I will say we're, we're really excited about summer. We're excited for now um, that most of the baseline services are anticipated to provide robust programming to welcome young people back to programs um, for, I don't have the budget numbers in front of me, but I know my colleague can help me out. For um, the Beacon Community Centers, which is about 91 school-based programs, will serve roughly 15,000 young people. Uh, the Cornerstone Community Centers, we have 99 of those in NYCHA development, developments, will serve an estimated uh, 5,000 additional uh, youth in addition to the adults um, that get services at those centers. And the Compass Elementary programs, um, roughly 40,000 seats. So together, youth services, we're planning for about 60,000 young people to be served through the baseline services that are funded right now. And Jajinia can maybe give uh, some budget specifics? Sure. Um, so Susan, you got those numbers um, correct. All told um, for, just give, give me one second here as I flip through my briefing book. Um, all told, we have over for all programs, Compass, Beacons, Cornerstone for fiscal year 21, we are have 633.9 million devoted to um, youth services. Okay. Thank you. Um, between the November 2020 plan and the preliminary plan, DYCD, has a total cut of $718,000 in fiscal 2021 and $200,000 cut in fiscal year 200, uh, 2022 for hiring and attrition savings. How will this hiring freeze impact DYCD's ability to provide high quality summer program? And does DYCD feel the agency has enough staff in place to support this work? So 
you know, I, obviously any commissioner would want as many staff as possible, but I think uh, we're prepared to move ahead with our summer services, uh, even though these vacancies can't be filled. Uh, you know, it, a lot of it, uh, there's, there are certain uh, efficiencies that working remotely have helped us. We can reach more people now remotely than we did before. Uh, it's interesting, we, we had this conversation about how the world will change when we come back in the office and uh, remote activities are actually a way of reaching more people with fewer staff. So if I was given a choice, I would love the authority to hire these people, but I think we're in good shape as far as uh, making sure services are delivered. The very fact that we weren't able to hire people, but still get um, our, our contracts registered, our programs paid, is a testimony to the dedication of our staff and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, the strength of our data systems to be able to get things done, even though we weren't working in person and even though we didn't have all the staff we might have wanted. Okay. Um, is DYCD securing a reliable supply chain of PPE for its providers? Uh, the answer is yes. In fact, we've had monthly distributions. And if you walk through our offices, and I, you know, I come here, you know, every so often, there are boxes of PPEs on every single floor. And we have regular distributions uh, for different program areas and staff from the different program areas have to come here and assist our administrative staff to make sure that the PPEs, whether they be uh, masks, sanitizers, everything, uh, we, uh, I believe the number, and, and we can update it, but the number at the end of last year, I think was something like 2 million PPEs were distributed by us. I'm sure that number has significantly increased. So none of, um, none of our DYCD programs are incurring costs for, no. um, for PPE or, or maintenance? Uh, we're, we're, all this stuff is being distributed for free. Okay. Last summer site placement was very difficult given the timing of the pandemic and that the DOE was closed. What does summer camps um, look like this year um, in, in terms of, um, of whether or not these sites are going to be available and the frequency of, of their availability? I'll start and then Susan can add some more detail. It's our hope that we'll be able to resume a full in-person services with whatever safety protocol the state puts in place. And we're still waiting for the state health department as well as the Office of Children and Family Services to give us guidance on this. Um, the more advanced guidance they give us, the better prepared we can be and the better prepared our program providers can be. Uh, but our intent is to keep remote services to a minimum and offer as much in-person services as possible. Um, Susan, do you have anything else to add? No, that's right, Bill. We're working very closely with DOE on um, where to as possible. So we work closely with DOE to look at which schools will be open and um, you know, trying to make the best uh, locations for, for young people and families. Um, Commissioner Haskell, um, what has been the impact on programs when uh, schools are closed because of an outbreak of, um, of you know, COVID-19? Chair, you mean like during, I'm sorry. You mean like during the school year and, and after school? Yes. Uh, well, I just wanna take this opportunity to recognize like the valiant efforts of our community-based providers connecting with young people in person when the school site is open and available and pivoting sometime at a moment notice to remote because there have been you know several cases of COVID in a school and there's a closure for 10 days. So they have made Herculean efforts to stay connected. These relationships are more important than ever for young people, um, the ability to be engaged in recreational activities. So it, it, it you know it would be crazy for me to say anything other than it's been a, a real challenge. Um, but they have risen very much so to the challenge to make themselves available when the schools are open. Um, you know, there was delayed opening, there were closures of elementary, there were closures of middle. We're so pleased those schools are reopened now and, 
And um, similarly, possibly for, for high schools in the future, it's been a real challenge and they've done an amazing job. And if I could add that I also want to thank our staff. Uh, I think it's something like 30 or 40 staff people who volunteered to staff the Situation Room, which is the nerve center to coordinate the opening and closing of schools when uh, COVID cases are detected. Um, you know, 30 or 40 people may not sound like a lot of people, but our, we only have 500 people. And these are people who are doing their regular jobs and at the same time volunteering at the Situation Room. And so that, you know, they're unsung heroes. They work behind the scenes, but, you know, because of their hard work, we're able to like respond quickly to incidents and then close programs when necessary and then reopen them uh, when uh, the situation is, is safe. What does the agency anticipate that summer camp enrollment will be? Uh, I think Susan can probably give you a sense of that. I think that, you know, that is a question we don't have a, a, a firm answer for, but I'll tell you, we feel it's our responsibility to make sure that we're enforcing safety protocol, which has been, you know, again, tremendous cooperation from our providers and that our doors are wide open to welcome families back this summer. We see this as a real opportunity to re-engage, to help young people get practiced in, um, in 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 person activities and to build confidence leading into the to, to the school year to get them comfortable um, being back you know in groups again with safe social distancing so um, how what the uptick looks like what the confidence level of families is I think you know TBD we feel it's our job just to be ready to welcome them with open arms and um, figuratively speaking and um, and give them start to rebuild those those social emotional skills and in-person activities. And I will add that our goal is to have full enrollment. And I think a lot will be driven by the health and safety situation, the vaccination rates. And, you know, as we've seen in the, in, with the, with schools, a lot of parents have understandable concerns about the safety of sending their children to in-person instruction. And so as we begin to ramp up the vaccination of, 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 of people, I'm hoping that the confidence level that parents will have uh, about sending their children to in-person uh, services will uh, increase. And what efforts are we taking to ensure that uh, the providers um, know what that's gonna look like so that they can uh, maximize the enrollment? So I'll start and then Susan can add. Early on, um, the state uh, authorized uh, vaccination priorities for young, uh, for staff people who deal with young people. So we aggressively uh, promoted that because we wanted to make sure as many staff of youth programs that work directly with young people got vaccinated because that that that's key to providing in-person services. As many youth workers vaccinated, and so that started. I want to say a month or so ago because uh, hopefully by the summer. Every person who's going to be, every staff person who's going to be working in the summer camp um, will be vaccinated. Uh, Susan may have other things that we're, we're working on, but, you know, as I've said in the past, to do a good summer program, you need months and months of planning. And so we started as early as February, getting the word out to, to our youth workers about getting vaccinated. Susan, well, I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear that you, um, you start planning months and months ahead of time. Um, because the providers also need that kind of time to prepare to run effective programming. When will they know that these programs are going to be in place so that they um, so that they can do the preparation that they need so they can meet the enrollment targets? Susan, I think we've already communicated to people. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just, this is a great opportunity to repeat that. I think there's uncertainty because, uh, you know, last year was such an extraordinary experience where um, funding was, uh, you know, eliminated at the peak of the pandemic and then partially restored, um, you know, as, as we got closer to the summer. We have much more certainty this spring than we had last spring, and we are moving full steam ahead with those baseline programs that we outlined. Um, and so we are encouraging providers to do all the planning and preparations that that you know are typically done in addition to um, utilizing the things they've learned last summer and over the school year about how to operate safely. 
Um, and last year, um, due to the pandemic, SYEP functioned 100% uh, remotely. When the committee last spoke with DYCD, strategic discussions were beginning to take place to plan this summer's model. What has the process been with DYCD and the providers to plan this summer's model? So let me start and then Daphne can fill in more detail. Uh, one of the things that is an important principle at DYCD and that more so than ever during this pandemic is to have a bottom-up process. So in the early part of this year, we surveyed our summer youth employment program providers to get a sense of what challenges they face, what's the likelihood of in-person uh, uh, internships, what's the likelihood of virtual internships. And so uh, the key, and, uh, and Daphne can give you more detail, uh, is, and they've been informed, I think there was a meeting uh, on Monday of this, uh, this week, is flexibility. That we're committed to serving 70,000 young people, uh, but we're gonna give maximum flexibility to each program because the situation on the ground is different. Some communities were harder hit and there are many more businesses were closed. And so we wanna give people flexibility, but Daphne can give you a little bit more detail. Um, yes. Uh, oh, sorry, Daphne, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was just going to uh, concur with uh, the commissioner uh, on our engagement efforts. We have been in discussion with our providers uh, since uh, the start of the year, and uh, we I have actually been able to work with our providers in developing what we feel will be a model uh, that addresses their concerns and incorporates their feedback. Um, and we were able to share that model with them uh, this past Monday as a group. Um, and just at a high level, uh, younger youth will continue to participate in, and be engaged in project-based learning activities. Um, however, however, providers can continue to deliver these activities remotely should they choose to do so as they did through Summer Bridge. And for older youth, we're going to be offering two tracks. Uh, the first track will be the traditional SYEP experience where a young person is engaged in a work activity for the full 150 hours. However, uh, providers can uh, assign those uh, experiences either in person, remote, or a hybrid uh, of the two. And then the second option will have young people participate uh, a portion of their hours uh, within a skills-based training opportunity, and then another portion tied to a work experience. And again, that can be delivered either remotely, in person, or a hybrid. The uh, training would ideally be tied to their work assignment or their industry. Um, and so we, we have had conversations with providers. The model that we propose is informed by them. We look forward to continuing conversations with them on how DYCD can best support uh, them in their efforts in delivering the model successfully this summer. If a, a hybrid model is, is chosen, um, how many participants could the programming um, serve? So overall, uh, we're looking to serve based on the preliminary budget, uh, 70,000 uh, young people. Um, and of course, uh, a portion of uh, the uh, of the 70,000 will be older youth. Um, it will depend on uh, work site availability. Employers may choose to uh, have more remote internship opportunities uh, developed versus in person. But as we get closer into the summer, we're hoping that some of the restrictions may ease uh, comfort of participants and parents in, in uh, allowing for in-person work experiences will take place. Um, so I think we'll have a better sense of what those placements will look like as we get closer to this spring and summer. Um, there's uh, been talk of an option two that um, uh, sort of a, a credentialing component if this programming becomes more robust with the credentialing component, um, is the agency prepared to cover the additional program costs that the providers would have to incur um, and, and not expect the, the providers to pick up and cover these fees? So we why, are- Why don't you talk about, first, could you start by talking about the credentialing um, component? 
what that program looks like um, and, uh, and whether or not the providers would have to incur any fees, additional fees. Yes, uh, so the hybrid model, um, again, uh, was one of the ideas that many of the providers had shared as an alternative to the standard SYEP experience, given uh, some of the concerns around the lack of worksite availability. Um, in putting this uh, hybrid model uh, plan together, uh, we feel that young people will have the opportunity to uh, work and in, in industries or in assignments where they could benefit from additional skills-based training. Uh, for example, a young person could take part in an Excel training and uh, also also have a work experience uh, doing data input and data analysis or take part in early childhood uh, educational training and then place at a child care site to round out their experience. Currently, DYCD is working with a number of platforms uh, such as Coursera, LinkedIn Learning, uh, Skillshare uh, in developing resources that uh, could be available to providers uh, free of charge to them uh, to deliver these services to, uh, to their participants should they choose the hybrid model. Okay. Um... And uh, when will uh, when will that decision be made of whether or not they would you know participate in the sort of the credentialing um, component of these programs? Sure. So our providers work very closely with our participants during the enrollment process and uh, placement process to ascertain their interests and their needs. And I think uh, also a, a determining factor will be the number of work site, uh, number of work sites that are available to the providers as well. So I think as uh, the work site development uh, starts uh, in full force in the coming weeks, uh, providers will have a clearer sense of which options they will have available, what trainings they will offer, um, and the modes in, in terms of how they will deliver uh, work experience for our young people. Um, what will be the slot allocation for SYEP um, in terms of uh, community-based slots, school-based, and special initiative slots? Sure. What's so... Yes, uh, so uh, we're still uh, working with our providers now to ascertain their capacity. So uh, preliminarily, we are looking at community-based slots serving uh, just under 45,000. Uh, that's inclusive of the older youth, younger youth, and ladders for leaders slots. Uh, we're looking to scale up our career ready option to 14,000 uh, to serve 14,000 young people and our special initiatives uh, will be approximately 9,700 uh, slots this year. Well, um, will you consider setting aside slots for young people from the 27 uh, neighborhoods that were most impacted by COVID-19? Yes, every effort will be made to ensure that we're serving high need youth, um, as we did with Summerbridge. Um, and so uh, all of our efforts around recruitment, particularly around the special initiative uh, options, inclusive of our NYCHA and emerging leaders uh, programs will really uh, be targeted towards reaching young people within those communities. Do you know how many slots that would accommodate? Uh, so currently we're looking at emerging leaders serving roughly 4,300 uh, young people uh, and our NYCHA uh, options, we're looking to serve uh, roughly 4,600 uh, between uh, the Career First NYCHA program and our Map to Success uh, program. And the only thing I would add is that of the 45,000 community uh, uh, seats or jobs, that many of them are located in the 33 neighborhoods that were most impacted. I mean, one of the things that uh, is unique about DYCD is that uh, we tend to allocate the overwhelming majority of our money in poor neighborhoods. So when the 33 neighborhoods were identified, you could lay a map of all the DYCD programs over those neighborhoods. 
So we're, we're, as I said to you, I think in a phone call last week, UYC is one of the few agencies in, this, in the city whose mission is to fight poverty. So uh, it's built into our DNA and certainly uh, we're very mindful of it in every program that we uh, roll out. Currently the, the NYCHA slot, slots are, are um, for specific NYCHA developments. Um, is there any um, move to, toward including all of the NYCHAs um, in, uh, in that pot so that uh, regardless of what NYCHA a young person lives in, they could be considered for those slots? So let me start and then uh, Daphne can maybe add on. Uh, I think it's a mistake to say that the only young person who uh, gets a summer job are those in the uh, Math for Success program. A lot of young people who live in public housing uh, also get jobs through the community options. And I forgot the number from 2019, but it was a significant number of young people in total of the um, uh, people who got jobs were either through the Map for Success or through the community outreach. Uh, obviously, if we want to do more targeting, uh, if additional resources became available beyond the 70,000, we can certainly accommodate that. But I don't know if you have anything more to add, Daphne. Uh, what I I'm sorry. I would just add that uh, last year uh, through the Summer Bridge program, we did allow our um, career first providers uh, to uh, work with uh, developments outside of their contracted developments. And it's something that our providers have asked for us uh, to consider again this summer. And uh, we, we are prepared to provide that flexibility as well. Thank you. That's, that's the flexibility that I, I was talking about. Not, um, increasing that number, but giving more um, public development, um, you know, residents the opportunity to be in that special targeted pot of, of jobs. Thank you. Um, and uh, when will the SYEP application go live? In the next few weeks, we don't have a final date, but uh, you will be the first to know. <sighs> Uh, okay, I hope so. And, and getting applications, I must say, in, in my 16 years with DYCD, it's amazing how consistent the number of applications are. Part of it, is, I think, uh, in 2005, we went away from carbon copy applications. I know, it's hard to believe, but carbon copy to an online application. So the very fact that we, it's an online application has made it easier for uh, uh, young people to apply. So every year we get between 130 to 150,000 applications. It's a pretty consistent number. So, um, and this time we will have enough time, unlike last year, which as you know, was a very chaotic process. Mm -hmm. um, and um, before I, uh, I give the floor to, um, to our public advocate, um, Teens Take Charge made a recommendation to DYCD that young people who apply for SYEP, but whose names are not pulled from the lottery are sent a list of compiled resources of free programs like Coursera, CUNY classes, and other online learning options for the summer or other programs that the city provides. Is DYCD willing to work with youth advocates and teens take charge to compile existing opportunities like this to send to any SYEP applicant who isn't selected this year? I believe for the last, I wanna say seven years that uh, DYC has always done a resource guide for alternatives to summer youth employment program. It's usually on our website. And so operationally, I defer to, uh, to Daphne to see what is doable. Okay. Um, uh, Commissioner, I, I would like to ask if we could set up a meeting um, in the next few weeks to discuss and review all of the details uh, that we've discussed today. Sure. Um, okay. I mean, and, um, I, think that, I think the program staff will probably be able to help a lot more with the details, but I think you know our commitment is always to make sure every young person can access resources, whether it's through the programs we fund or through programs we don't fund because we recognize that summer is an important time for a young person. And this summer more than ever, 
Uh, we want to do everything we can to normalize life for young people as the city moves back to recovery. Right. Thank you. Um, and um, and uh, I just want to acknowledge that Council Member Eugene has also joined us. And um, I would then I would now like to um, ask our public advocate um, if he would like to ask a round of questions. I thank you so much, uh, Chair Rose. I uh, very much appreciate the opportunity. And once again, just thank you for your leadership on all of this, and especially around the summer youth jobs, which uh, you helped lead uh, us to increase to begin with. Uh, um, Chair Chan, just a, a couple of questions. Um, just first with NYCHA, a career first NYCHA served about 865 youth in nine developments. Do you know how many young people in NYCHA uh, you plan to aim, you serve uh, this year? Uh, Daphne can give you this uh, slot anal analysis. The one thing I will say, and Daphne can elaborate, the big challenge in talking to our partners at the Housing Authority is getting young people to apply. Um, we, we, the feedback we got two years ago was um, they thought the jobs, the guaranteed jobs through uh, Math for Success were somehow inferior to the other jobs. And they would apply for jobs in the, the community op the lottery option as opposed to applying for a guarantee job. Part of that was branding. They had bad experiences in the past. And so we did a focus group and we kind of renamed it Math for Success. So that was part of it, educating people. And then there were other barriers, but I think part of it was changing the perception of the program so that it was not an inferior program, but it was a high quality program. And then Daphne can talk about this year and what we're doing. Well, also, if you have the number of residents in NYCHA who received any job, that's helpful. Oh, uh, we may have to get back to you, but if we can tell you how many young people who live in public housing uh, got summer jobs. Daphne? Yeah. Uh, yes, so to the uh, first question regarding um, the slot allocation for this year, uh, we're looking at our career first uh, option to serve over 1400 young people and our map to success uh, option to serve over 3200. And uh, I'll have to get back to you in terms of the total number of NYCHA residents that were served uh, back in uh, last year, and uh, we could also share for 2019 as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and now uh, to the summer youth, the preliminary hazard at 70,000, you yourself said that uh, routinely 130 to 150,000 young people uh, apply. We've been trying to get it to universal, and most people agree that 100,000 would count as universal since everybody would apply who applied would not take the job. Uh, do you support increasing the number of slots? Commission? If additional money becomes available, I think the history of DYCD is that we never turn away money. Uh, I remember one summer, uh, I want to say five years ago, the years kind of blend together. I think the council, uh, before the money was baseline, I think the council added 30,000 jobs, uh, literally at the last minute, and our staff and our nonprofit partners stepped up and made it happen. So if additional money becomes available, we certainly will expand the program. And, and, and I think in the history of the, of, 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 of the program, every year, as far back as I can remember, the city council has, has always added additional jobs. So we're ready to take on the additional funding. Um, I would just say uh, I was a council member then and, and the council really led the charge in increasing that. The frustration was, I would say, Commissioner, when I remember you, didn't, you weren't particularly assisting us in, in, in pushing for those changes. There seemed to be a resistance of, for you to even ask for additional funds. So I think it'll be helpful if here today- well, if I could say what I say in public and what I say in private is always the same. Understood. Um, but I, I think it would be helpful if we can get even some uh, more public statements to push this up to 100,000. Well, as, you know, as I said, if we get additional money, we can definitely support um, more jobs, uh, whether that's city tax levy, whether that's stimulus money, uh, you know, certainly, uh, as I've said in the past, the sooner we know about funding, the better. Uh, right. Last year, as you know, we didn't have any program uh, funds for summer programs until 15 minutes before the start of the fiscal year. And uh, our staff and our nonprofit partners stepped up and did the summer bridge program and 35,000 young people were served. 
So certainly if there's additional money, my only request is that it happens sooner than later. It's, it's the best interest of young people because they'll have more time to apply and it's the best interest of the, our nonprofit partners who can plan. So I certainly support more, uh, more jobs if there was more money. Uh, thank you. And it's important, even now, as we're saying, we're doing some remotely and hybrid. In the past, part of the hesitation had been um, getting providers. I think uh, with the new model, that may make things even a little easier. So my hope is that the mayor is listening and put some more funds in there for these uh, slots. Just two more quick questions. One, um, I've asked this before, uh, and I used to ask it more routinely in prior administration, but when these cuts are happening, uh, whether it was last year's cuts or this year's cuts, is there any conversation with NYPD or any other uh, agencies about the impact they may, that may have on public safety or crime in the areas where these programs are funded? So we've been talking to the NYPD for the last three years, I would say, because I think they, uh, we've always recognized the connection between safety and youth programming. And I think they recognize it now. And so, uh, so budget issues aside, one of the things we've been doing, and this happened, I think, last fall, we did a training for the youth coordination officers at the police academy and uh, show them how to use our app, Discover DYCD, because we want to make sure young people who are hanging out on the streets, not enrolled in our programs, know where their programs are. And so instead of an officer having a negative interaction with a young person who might be hanging out on the streets, they can have a tool to encourage a positive interaction by connecting them to services, whether it's a community center, whether it's an after school program. And last year we had a pretty um, ambitious plan to help young people. I'm not sure if we can do it this year. We had uh, a, a, a special code where a young person could scan on the code and then get an application into the uh, public housing jobs. I, I know, Daphne, is that still in the works or is that something we couldn't do this year? So uh, we are in discussions with the NYPD on how to best uh, share information on uh, the application um, and also working very closely with our NYCHA partners as well uh, as we uh, gear up for the launch of the application. Well, I'm glad those conversations are happening. Uh, it sounded like uh, particularly starting last fall I'd love to drill down more on that. Hopefully, uh, maybe uh, you know, outside of this a hearing, uh, that's a very important conversation. Uh, but so, my last question is, uh, you know, healing-centered schools and trauma-responsive uh, educational programs uh, have been the center of conversations around youth empowerment. Uh, is the agency working on adopting those models uh, for your program? So let me start, and then Susan Haskell can add in. Uh, for the last, I want to say, seven or eight years, we've had a a conference for our providers called Healing the Hurt. And it was really to uh, incorporate uh, trauma-informed uh, care in all our programs, whether they be after-school programs or programs serving homeless youth. And so we've been working with our technical assistance provider. Uh, they're called Vibrant. They used to be called the Mental Health Association, but they rebranded themselves as Vibrant. So Susan can talk a little bit about that because she's also our, our lead on Thrive-related initiatives. Yeah, that's exactly right, Bill. I think leading, you know, leading up to the pandemic, DYCD put a tremendous amount of focus on mental health resources and Thrive really helped, um, you know, coalesce some of those efforts. So training for providers who are working directly with young people, training for DYCD staff to help providers who reach out to us and say, we've got this situation, we're not sure what to do. This young person is in crisis, this family's in crisis. We've offered a more intense tips training, we call it, um, which many provider agency have sent staff to that that um, really digs deeper. It's not a one-time training that goes on for months, again, through Vibrant, as Bill mentioned. And um, did I say mental health first aid, of course, has been a priority with the agency and um, getting those resources to community programs. We recently updated a guide for mental health resources. In other words, we're supporting our providers to have those skills and resources, but there are situations where a young person needs further support, clinical care, et cetera. And, and uh, my colleague Paula and many of our colleagues have put together a resource guide to share with providers so they can, you know, at a glance have those um, at their fingertips when, it, when it's needed. Uh, thank you, I'd love to follow up on that as well. Thank you so much, Commissioner and uh, company, and thank you, Chair Rose. Thank you.
thank you so much, public advocate um, Jamani Williams. Um, uh, council, I, I just want to um, uh, sort of uh, ask a question about uh, teens take charge. They asked about their um, about making available um, opportunities that are that could be available to young people who didn't get selected for summer youth employment. Um, and I'm really glad to hear uh, from Commissioner Haskell that we have a resource guide for mental health services. Um, are the, do you have you increased your outreach budget so that young people are aware of all of these services that are, are now um, available um, that uh, they could access um, in the absence of not being uh, able to, to uh, participate in a structured program. Um, do you have a, a budget for outreach and, um, or, or to make these resources that you've developed available to the public? So let me start and Susan might have to add this is what I guess what I would say under the category of one of the silver linings of the pandemic that it's opened up a whole new way of reaching young people through the virtual outreach. And so one of the things that I don't think we've really talked about uh, after the George Floyd murder and the protests, I asked my staff to, to discuss what way can we engage young people to play a more of a leadership role uh, in the what I saw as an emerging new civil rights movement. And so uh, we turn to our youth leadership group, uh, My Brother and Sister's Keeper, which are made of young people who are part of the youth council network in our community centers. And they came up with the idea of having a virtual town hall meeting with thousands of young people every other month. And the first topic I think was in August and then focus on systemic racism. And I think the second one was on mental health issues. And I think that spurred us to kind of look at what kind of resources we can develop. So. One of the main vehicles that we didn't have before the pandemic was these regular town hall meetings that are youth led. In fact, the one that was done, I think this past month was on entrepreneurship. They pick the topics, we get the speakers, we just help them set it up. So uh, the answer to your question, we've increased our budget by getting more young people involved in doing outreach. Uh, Susan, anything you wanna add? No, Bill, I think you hit it right on the head. And, and it's um, it, it's like resources in a way we take for granted, not necessarily money you see in our budget, but us developing like the skills through technology and through our IT systems, Discover DYCD, um, our platforms that is really making the difference. And young people, quite frankly, they're not gonna read a flyer, but they will read a tweet or uh, something sent to them on their social media. So we're trying to reach young people where they're at. Okay. Um, again, I'd like to thank uh, our public advocate for, um, for his questions. And I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by council members Lewis and council members Riley. And now um, uh, committee council, uh, if you would open the floor to, um, to our uh, co council committee colleagues for questions. Thank you, Chair Rose. We will now hear questions from Council Member Chin, followed by Council Member Rosenthal. Council Member Chin. Time starts now. Great. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for your leadership, Commissioner Chong. It's good to see you. Um, I know that in the, I've been on the Youth Service Committee for the, my, uh, all my years in the City Council, um, starting in 2010. And I've seen the progress and especially in this last eight year uh, with this administration. I mean, the first four year was fighting against trying to restore all the cuts to all the wonderful programs. And, uh, and I'm glad that we are making progress. And so I, my question, uh, first one is on the SYEP program. Um, I know that I really wanna thank your staff and all the provider for really stepping up during the pandemic uh, to offer programs to our youth. And we're very happy to see that uh, the program was restored so that we don't have to start from zero like last year. Um, so with a 70,000 uh, slot, we still wanna fight for more. So I think that, I mean, when you say you're optimistic, we're optimistic 
And we wanna make sure that the providers are sort of prepared when the stimulus money come down, we will make sure we fight, you know, for some of that money to go into uh, the youth program. So within the SYEP program of 70,000 right now, how many are allocated for the lottery and how many are designated, you know, um, for a special program that youth will have a guaranteed job? Uh, That's Daphne, my first question. Daphne can give you that number, but I think uh, the, the lottery is 45,000 and the rest is targeted programs. Is that correct, Daphne? Yes, that's correct. That's great. Yeah, because I think we, we want more slots to be really designated because, you know, lottery is like hit and miss for a lot of the youth and especially, you know, less than every year, you know, over like 130 to 150,000 apply. And that's why we want to make sure that we strive for universal, that every kid who's interested in a summer youth job or a summer youth program should be able to get one. And I'm also happy to see that, you know, summer camp, um, uh, Sonic Compass, they're restored. Um, I wanted to ask like the, the new need that you put in, the 57 million for Learning Bridge, what is that gonna, what's that program and how many kids are gonna be served? Uh, Susan can uh, give you an answer to that. Yeah, I'll also rely on my colleague Jadine to fill in some gaps on the funding part. That is the Learning Lab program that we ramped up to provide childcare programming on the alternate days of a DOE student who's enrolled in hybrid learning. So that those contractors were, you know, ramped up as you know in the fall, and um, we're pretty well set at this time in terms of um, the established programs that we have. And I think um, again, I defer to Jadine. We're still working out the revenue sources on that. Um, but we are ensuring that we have enough funding to provide the reimbursement that providers need. Jindy? That's correct, Susan. No, you're, you're 100 percent correct. Um, the 57 um, million that was added to the budget um, matches the 70 million that's there for learning labs. So all told, we have about 127 um, million dollars um, devoted to learning labs. OK. And then, and then my final question is, what is the justification for cutting back on Sonnet, you know, the Sonnet program, uh, the middle school kids? I mean, everybody talk about how important it is for teenagers to be engaged. And we have gotten so much positive reaction from parents and kids uh, to the middle school after school program and summer program. So what is the justification for cutting that program? I don't think there was a justification, I think. As I said earlier, in late January, when the plenary budget was coming out, um, things did not look good. The state was talking about billions of dollars of cuts it was going to pass on to local cities and municipalities. The city's revenue situation was um, fluid, and we didn't know what the American Rescue Plan would look like. Now that it's not, you know, it's in front of us now, and it's going to be signed into law tomorrow, I think there's more confidence that. Um, there's flexibility in looking at restorations as the budget director said during his testimony uh, last week. So you're, so you're confident or optimistic that we can restore this program back? And I'm confident, to... it's, it's my number one priority because as you know that uh, we were relatively unscathed this year. That's good, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I think you know we have made a lot of progress um, in this last eight year under Chair Rose, and we've continued to advocate more for our youth. And we see a lot of them, you know, like the Teen Take Charge, they're getting more active. And I'm really happy to hear uh, because of the virtual platform that we're able to reach more young people. That I really want to thank DYCD that you, your staff, you know, and the provider are being so creative during the pandemic. Uh, to make sure that our kids are engaged. So thank you. And thank you, know, you uh, If you want to know, learn more about the town hall meetings, I believe we tape them or are, oh, okay. so I, I, I'm the last person to talk about tech, but I think there are a YouTube page. Uh, so, and they're very interesting because it's uh, youth led, it's the young people talking and the, there's no voice for adults. And it's interesting to hear, I mean, they pick the topics 
So uh, early on, when they picked the topic of mental health resources, I was surprised, but now it's clear they understood what was happening to their peers. And you see all these stories about suicides and the yeah. sense of how isolation has affected young people. So I believe it's on our YouTube channel, but you know, we'll, someone will get back to you. Andrew Miller will get back to you if that's the case. But I think- Yeah, please, really please share with the council. I think awesome. all my colleagues probably would be interested in, in uh, you know, seeing it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council member Chin. We will now turn to council member Rosenthal for her questions. Time starts now. Thank you so much and welcome. Um, uh, committee Council to your first hearing. You're doing a bang up Alrighty. job. Um, Go on if you want to start. Uh, so, Chair Rose, yeah. it's right. uh, always so great to see to you. The We You Town Hall, everyone. My oh, name is Kwan. You know what? And I'll be this one is of my problem. Today. Hang on uh, one today's second. Today's topic is economic equality. So I found the, um, <laughs> sorry, I accidentally clicked on. Listen to it after the hearing. I will, I will. I think there's I three or four listen, of them. Just so you know, sir, that they're all there and, okay. and they look fabulous. I'm, I'm excited to find them. Chair Rose, it's great to see you. Thank you for, as always, chairing this incredible hearing. Um, Commissioner, I'm heartbroken to hear that you would be leaving public. I hope you're not leaving public service. Um, you, you've been, I've admired your work for a really long time. Thank and, you. Uh, you know, really appreciate all your good service. Um, I wanted to follow up first on um, something Council Member Chin just said. You know, uh, you're hopeful that the, um, uh, um, Sonic will be added back in. May I ask, uh, would it be possible for there to to diminish to decrease the amount of drama around it? Could you let us know when you know that it'll be back in, rather than um, rather than uh, us finding out when exec comes out? Um, you know, as you say, they're signing it tomorrow, and I'm sure, um, you know, I'm sure OMB will have a better sense of the numbers pretty quickly. So if you can, uh, and you can share it with the committee, I think that that'd be awfully helpful because it would help us figure out how to spend our time for what we're advocating for. No, I, I understand. I mean, I, you know, I've always advocated uh, with OMB that the sooner the better because summer programs take time. That's why with the summer jobs program, we, we, we convene people in January. That's why for summer camps, we start the plan in April because we know to do a quality program, it takes time. And right. you, can't, you can't plan if you don't have money. And so right. last year was short of a miracle. Thanks to the right. advocacy by the council, uh, you know, I know 15 minutes before the start of the fiscal year and uh, People work night and day, our staff and our providers to get, uh, to get programs off the ground. I don't want to repeat that. I don't think anyone wants to repeat that. And you've, you've led me right into my next question. I appreciate that. Um, and that is frankly about the treatment of the nonprofits and how we um, show our appreciate, appreciation to them for, for doing all this work particularly in this case at the absolute last minute. Um, do you happen to know uh, how your nonprofits are doing with the loss of the indirect rate that was sort of pulled out from underneath all of us, the rug was pulled out. So I know a lot of, in, a lot of nonprofits that were counting on that money and then, you know, lost it. I think that everyone who applied for it was eligible, but maybe Jadine can give some uh, sense of the timeline of who got indirect and who didn't. Great. Sure. Hi, Council Member Rosenthal. I'm going to ask that Navita Bailey also be unmuted because she has been leading the charge on my team um, regarding the um, ICR. Navita, are you live? Yes, I am. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, so good morning. Um, so DYCD, um, in partnership with Mock's CIT team, 
has been working to ensure that providers will be able to get access to it. And so we were not necessarily in charge of the outreach or recruitment, although we've done all the communication in partnership with MOCS, but providers have the opportunity to enroll in the entryway and to um, access the funding. And so that entryway closed December 31st, a while back, but all the, you know, there was a lot of outreach repeatedly to nonprofits to enter into it. And so for those that have entered into it, DYSD is moving forward with processing um, those who um, are enrolled. All right. I'd love to explore this a little bit more with you, Ms. Bailey, because um, I do, I, I hear what you're saying, and I know there was some de minimis level of increase for indirect rate that um, Time providers. Chair, may I continue a little? I think that was a yeah. yes. Yes, okay. yes, you can finish it. Thank you. Um, but uh, the increase they were allowed to get was, was tiny and they had been promised a much bigger increase. And between the executive budget last year and adoption, all that money was withdrawn from the budget. So the nonprofits had expected to get the money. We thought they were getting the money, but the administration in the 11th hour just yanked it. So I, I guess I, what I'm asking is just that you, if you could, yes, they got a small amount and, and that's great that you're helping them apply, but you know, it might be helpful to check in to see how they're doing because they lost a lot of money they expected to get. So you know, my suggestion would... is to have the conversation more productive is to probably in, engage the mayor's office of contract services and oh, OMB. Yeah because they're the decision makers on this. Yeah. Um, I know the indirect thing is kind of varies from agency to agency. Some have a very high indirect rate, some already at the 10%. So it's a, a more nuanced conversation. So we can certainly uh, let Mox and OMB know that you wanna have this conversation, but they're the ones who've made decisions about uh, the deadline and then all the things that I know um, created confusion. Yeah, no, you're spot on right about that. Absolutely. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that the ACOs at each of the agencies, the contract people who interact with the nonprofit, have a firm understanding of this really unfortunate thing that happened so they can help guide their agencies, their nonprofits, through this experience, which is super confusing. Um, and all done at the last minute. You're right. In the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> nice, yeah. So we understand the concern and the challenges and that some CBOs are um, struggling to navigate through all of it. And so what we do is we try to ensure that we inform our staff internally um, with the policy so they're, they're best informed so they can be able to provide assistance where needed. But as the commissioner mentioned, um, regarding the funding of it, um, DYSD has no role um, Yep. Chair Rose, that, may I ask? Not. Thank you. Chair Rose, may I ask just one more question? You can say no. Yes, you can quickly. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm wondering about the Learning Labs programs and what experience you have um, had with serving uh, children with disabilities. We've um, heard from multiple sources that that has been a real cha challenge for families of children with disabilities. And um, one of the issues was that the nonprofit said, look, we're just not equipped to, to serve someone with these types of needs. And supposedly the administration said they might add funding so that nonprofits could, you know, get the resources they need. Um, or somehow they were working on it. And I was just wondering what your experience has been with that. So I'll start and then Susan can give you the latest update. I think uh, the Learning Lab Initiative, as you know, was literally um, launched in a matter of weeks. Uh, so a lot of things uh, were rushed to get the program up and running. Uh, we mm -hmm. kind of did on a similar scale in two months what uh, UPK did in 18 months. Give you in the middle of a pandemic. 
So uh, certainly there were uh, areas we could have improved and helping young people with special needs was one of them. But I think we've uh, begun to address this issue with the help of the Department of Education. So Susan, you wanna give an update? Absolutely, and my colleague Tracy Cauldron is with us today. She's been really heroic in leading these efforts. I wanna say to start that we got applications from a roughly proportionate number of students with IEPs and 504s. And our providers are very experienced and knowledgeable about working with young people with special needs. And many young people were served with reasonable accommodations in those programs. There, you know, when we initially ramped up those programs, we did not have all the supports that the District 75 and other community schools have for young people. And so I think, you know, there were roughly uh, 50, you know, Tracy could correct me if I'm wrong, young families who needed supports beyond, for example, a paraprofessional who could be one on one, which wasn't part of, you know, this, the service model of, of a learning lab initially. Department of Education has been working very closely with, with us on individual families to work out those specific needs and for us to try to do what I think has never been done before, which is transfer some of those robust resources to learning labs where those young people can't be provided five days in school. So I think the first effort was when it's brought to our attention, well, let's see what we can do to get that young person back to their, the resources they're comfortable and familiar with. And if not, um, my colleague working closely with DOE has been um, doing that on a case by case basis. Do you know if funding is added for it? No, those, are, those resources are coming from the Department of Education um, directly. But I mean, it's in, it's so does time. DOE add funding for the nonprofit to have, for example, a one on one para? It's in kind services. So they assign a, a, one of their people to a learning lab. So there's no exchange of money. I see. But so it's in kind no, services. Yeah, I got it. Huh, that's rough. Right. Look, it's all rough. Thank you for all your work. Thank you, Chair Rose, for your patience. Thank you so much, Council Member Rosenthal. Um, are there any other um, questions from colleagues? Uh, Does not appear that we have any other questions. So if you have additional questions, Chair Rose, feel free. Okay. Um, thank you. I, I wanna thank my colleagues for um, asking those insightful questions. And, um, and uh, uh, I, I would like if, uh, if the uh, if DYCD could let us know in advance of the town hall meetings, because some of us would like to uh, participate, not not to talk. Listen, but no, we talk, not to talk. Them, but but we would love to listen, okay. you know, um, to our, our, our youth leaders um, and get it, you know, fresh off the presses. So um, I, I want to circle back to uh, Council Member Chin and Council Member Rosenthal's uh, questions about learning bridges. And uh, can you can can um, the agency confirm? Can you confirm that the Federal Stimulus CARES Act funds applied for this program will cover the cost of programming and be drawn down regardless of actual enrollment outcomes? That's a question I think OMB is going to have to answer because well, the devil is in the details. And so we don't know what the legislation says specifically. I'm sure they will have to review it and determine what, what, can, what stimulus money can be applied and what can't. Um, you know, in 2009, the last time there was a federal stimulus plan, plan um, DYCD received money across the board in stimulus funds. And there were all kinds of strings attached to it. So I don't wanna speak out of turn. I think OMB needs to do an analysis to see what is uh, reimbursable and what isn't. Will you advise them as to, um, to what the need is? And, um, and uh, so that, you know, well, certainly. Can, um, apply the appropriate um, amounts? Yes, yeah, certainly the need is clear. I mean, I think Learning Labs is literally one of these programs that there was no dedicated funding stream. We kind of had to pull it together from different places. So I don't think need is the issue. The issue is what will the uh, American Rescue Plan funding allow us to do? And that I don't know the answer. And I think OMB is going to have to read through the weeds to find out uh, what we can do. But, you know, um, I'm, I'm hopeful. But again, OMB will have the final word on that. 
do you have any plans of expanding um, the programming and, um, and have you discussed continuing the program into fiscal year 2022? Um, to my knowledge, the Learning Labs program will end this fiscal year as the mayor has announced that uh, the goal is to return to in-person instruction at schools. And the whole premise of Learning Labs was predicated on uh, uh, young people doing hybrid learning. Um, and so since hybrid learning will no longer be happening in, in the new school year, I assume that learning bridges won't be needed. Um, when will we, we know that? I mean, that's, uh... That's not a definite where I know we're trying to get children back to schools, but are we, are we sure that uh, September we're gonna see full enrollment, in-person enrollment in school? That's a question that DOE can answer, but I know what the mayor announced is the goal is to get to in-person in learning back online last, in the fall. So, but again, the department of education will be the final say on that. Okay. Um, and, and I know our public is, is really excited to, um, to testify. So I have one more question. Um, and then I'll submit to you uh, some of the other questions that we have uh, sure. for answers, uh, just in the interest of time. But um, I'd like to know about um, hazard pay. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the administration allowed providers to make contracts amendments after March 2020. One critical area was to include more pay, effectively hazard pay, for providers working on the front line of the pandemic response. These increases expired in July 2020 and have not been renewed. Will the administration include hazard pay or the ability for providers to amend contracts in fiscal year 2022? This is something we're going to have to check with OMB on because they, have, as you know, they decide on the money, but I'm not aware of any uh, plan currently to renew the hazard pay uh, renewal. I don't know if Janine has anything more to add. Okay. Um, well, I, I want to thank the administration for your testimony here today. Um, Commissioner Chong, um, you've had a long and um, storied um, and, and very eventful, you know, tenure uh, with the um, with the uh, youth services uh, with DYCD, and um, you know, it's been a pleasure to work with you. Uh, I, I know it's been like a um, a husband wife uh, relationship. We've had our fights um, and our arguments. Um, I am sure that you've been. Um, I, I know that. Uh, you've always had the best intentions for the youth in New York City. Um, I, I'm really glad to see that we're on the same page. There's no need for a divorce, that we are amicably uh, leaving a city service at the same time. Um, and so uh, I, I just want to thank you for all that you're doing. And, um, and to, to one last, you know, one last uh, fight is to, to just make sure that you get Sonic restored uh, and, and work, learn, grow so that um, all of our young people uh, can be serviced. Um, I, I'm really going to miss you. Uh, I hope that this isn't the last um, committee meeting uh, hearing that we actually have a chance to, uh, to, to talk. Well, I want to thank the I want to thank the council for uh, and your leadership for the support over the years. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know, the advocacy from the outside has always been helpful to making sure funding got uh, uh, added to our budget. You know, DYC is one of those agencies. The program is programs that we uh, support are very popular and they're needed, but we're not legally mandated in anything we do. So the advocacy is always important, and we're always subject to what the economy looks like. And, and what the priorities of any mayor might be. You know, this mayor has put a priority on youth services and that's why our budget is more than doubled during this last eight years. But who knows what the next mayor, what his or her priorities might be. And as I said to you uh, last week, you know, um, uh, the next mayor, whoever he or she may be, 
will inherit a city that will face greater poverty and greater inequity. And DYC is one of the few agencies whose mission is to fight poverty. And it's my hope uh, as we mark the 25th anniversary of this agency, and we'll be doing something in the fall, probably a video, I'm not sure we'll be doing anything in person uh, to mark the 25th anniversary of this agency, which uh, no one thought uh, we would do the things we do now. Uh, the idea of putting all these different programs under one roof was in some ways an accident. It was a, I read the New York Times story back in 1996. It was a budget saving move to merge the community development agency and the Department of Youth Services to save money in the back office operations. That was the, how it, we, we were born. And so I think uh, hopefully we've taken it to a new level to focus on really fighting poverty and to have a collective impact approach so that the programs that operate in the same neighborhoods work together to help lift the quality of life in that community. So they don't operate in silos. So that hopefully is uh, the last big thing on my uh, bucket list before I sign off. But thank you again for all your support. Yes, and thank you and, um, and, and, and all of the staff uh, for, for their commitment to youth in New York City. Um, and, uh, and now I'm going to turn it back over to the moderator to gain some control um, and to call on the next panel. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rose. Thank you for the administration for testifying. We will now begin the public testimony portion of this hearing. First, I would like to remind everyone that I will call people up in individuals and panels. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you will begin your testimony once the Sergeant of Arms sets the clock and gives you the cue. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Remember that there is a few second delay when you are unmuted before we can hear you. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. And the first panel of public testimony in the order of speaking will be Samir Gamir, Shania Campbell, Ryan LaBerry, and Michael Rividanira. So, I will now call on Samir Gamir to speak. Time starts now. Thank you. First and foremost, I would like to thank all of you for giving me this platform to share my experiences with all of you. My name is Samir Gamir and I am a 16 year old who attends the Flushing YMCA. Let me first say that when people ask me what are some things that make me the person I am today, it's very hard to pick one, but if I had to choose, I would say 75% is because of the why and YMCA and 25% is because of my personality. The Y has given me so many experiences like climbing a 50 foot giant ladder to being able to go to city hall and even going to Washington DC to talk to our local, local Congress people. All these experiences I've had is because of the team programs like Team Take the City, Leaders Club and Role Scholars. Because of these opportunities, I was able to realize how important my voice really is and speaking about things you're passionate about is not a luxury, but rather a necessity. I think we can all agree that we miss our lives pre-COVID, whether that was not wearing a mask to having family dinners with our loved ones, but most importantly, just living our normal lives. For me, for me personally, when the pandemic hit, the main thing I missed was going to the Y to see my friends and counselors. When I was meeting with them on a daily basis, I never realized how important it was for me. But like all things, when something is taken away from us, we finally understand its true value. For me personally, the Y is essentially my second home in the sense that I get to truly be myself, make mistakes, and also have a place where I can try new things so I wouldn't be afraid to go outside my comfort zone so I can be ready for the real world. My dad even sometimes jokingly tells me when I come home from the Y that I should just take a sleeping bag over there and ask him if I could stay there just to limit the travel. Now, before the pandemic, I thought in order for me to do these things, I would have to be in person. Don't get me wrong when I say it doesn't feel the same, but nothing does anymore, so you just have to adapt to your surroundings. At first, it was a challenge because we were looking at all at our screens all day from school, and then we have to do the same thing for the Y. But the solution is after school ends, just take a small break, whether that's meditating or going out for a walk so you can feel refreshed and ready to go. There are also some perks of remote programming, like not having to travel at all, being able to see so many more people, and also having a new experience. So God forbid, if we were to have to deal with something like this again, we as teens and the Y will be ready to tackle any obstacles in our way 
so all the students can have a safe space they can go to to be themselves and get other resources that they need. At the end of the day, what I want all of you to take away from my speech is that without the why, I wouldn't have been able to discover myself as a person, and the why also gave me a platform to share my voice with all of you. It is vital for us to understand that the YMCA experience should not be taken for granted, and, and we should do as much as possible to give students resources like the why. So instead of just going home from school to play video games, they can go to a safe space with their peers so they can share their ideas and perspectives on so many things like homework to sports to maybe even politics. For me personally, without the YMCA, I would feel like I wouldn't be the person I am today. I would feel like my identity is incomplete, but I also I wouldn't know how much of an impact my voice can have on others, but also understand how people's voices would have such a big impact on myself and how I see things on society. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now call on Shania Campbell. Time starts now. Good morning, everyone. My name is Shania Campbell. I'm 15 years old and a field student at the field, uh, I'm a student at the field in school. I'm here to talk about my experience with the YMCA. I'd like to start off by saying thank you for this opportunity. In the words of Tony Robbins, communication is power. Those who have mastered its effective use can change their own experience of the world and the world's experience of them. However, to effectively communicate, we must understand that there's a difference in how each person perceives this world. So I ask that as you listen to this testimony, you keep an open mind and heart. Now I've been enrolled in the YMCA since first grade, but extremely active in team programming since the sixth grade. I can confidently say I would not be the person you see here today without it. I started a debate in fifth grade due, a push, due to a push from my YMCA supervisor. I found a passion of mine that enables me to be who I am, a transparent, strong-willed, confident leader, all thanks to the YMCA. Over time, it has become my home away from home. So when given the opportunity to shed light on the impact it's had on me, I couldn't decline. Now let's get into programming itself. The YMCA typically has many options to engage, educate, structure, and strengthen the youth. My personal favorites being Leaders Club and Teens Take the City. Now Leaders Club is exactly what it sounds like. It is a club that meets weekly, heavily focused on discussion-based learning that aims to bring out the qualities of a leader and its participants. Teens Take the City, also known as GTC, is a program focused on civic engagement and youth empowerment. Programs like these are crucial to students now more than ever. Everyone here knows that the circumstances we are experiencing are anything but normal. But if anything, if there's anything that is craved, it's normalcy. The YMCA is that for a lot of teens. But it could do so much more if it was able to run similar to how it did pre-COVID-19 with a higher budget. Currently, there are some programs run remotely via Zoom, but it's not the same. Not all branches have the ability to host remote meetings, and not all students have the ability to join them. At the beginning of the school year, I myself didn't know what to expect for programming. After all, just one day after I had attended my Y, it shut down and has yet to reopen for things other than learning labs. Yet, I was relieved and filled with hope when I found that I would at least have TTC. And not only values my voice, but keeps me critically thinking and involved. Outside all of this, the experiences gained from nonprofits like the Y are unlike any other. It has become essential. How many teens can say they travel to D.C. to speak with senators, meet with council members, and have weekends out of the year to re retreat, enjoy nature, and grow along like-minded teens? Not enough. Programs like these will never not be needed, so I urge that you recognize their importance and help to provide more. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now be calling on Ryan LaBerry to testify. Time starts now. Good morning. My name is Ryan LaBerry. And I'm a 16 year old from Flatbush, Brooklyn, New York. I'd first like to start by th saying that I'm thankful to speak on the behalf of an illustrious organization such as the YMCA of Great New York. I began to, to go to the YMCA in the sixth grade. I began to attend the YMCA in the ninth grade, while I truly began to participate in the YMCA in the 10th grade. During my time at the Y, I've had the opportunity to participate in teen programs such as Teen Second City, a program based around city government, but in a mock format. Leaders Club, a program that empowers young people to not only understand their role as the future, but as the present, and Role Scholars, a program based around gearing participants for the contemporary workforce ahead of us through future preparations. Through all of these programs, I found myself gaining something that I never thought I would gain as a result of participating, this being a new mindset. I've been able to strengthen myself as a person and by breaking out of my shell, expressing myself in areas through public speaking and building long lasting bonds with people I may have never met if not for the YMCA. I've also been blessed to have the opportunity to visit my um, congressman in DC, traveled to Washington State to, to study life in the water and to sadly witness the YMCA experience financial hardships 
due to the pandemic. Normally, I would attend the Flatbush YMCA since it's closer to me. However, due to hardships with the branch, I've been forced, not forced, but I've been ha had to re relocate to the North Brooklyn branch, which is a bit farther. I occasionally attend remote, but find myself taking the job more often since being remote does not provide that same atmosphere that I was in need of. I think many teens can test to, to the idea that virtual programs or education in of itself doesn't always provide that same benefit we see, we see for personal happiness. The YMC is a safe haven for money. Not being able to access that safe haven can be destructive to one's personal stability. It's worth it to note that a Harvard study reported that young people were heaviest hit due to the pandemic mental health impacts. They reported the highest in symptoms of loneliness, anxiety, and depression. Personally, participating in school doesn't always bring happiness, especially when you're a child of Caribbean parents who've had it way harder than you have, and you've tried to, to put yourself onto doing more rigorous activities and rigorous workloads. Finding ways to leave this burden was hard for me, and I know, if not for the YMCA, I would not be able to find ways to stay calm and productive while doing all I can to achieve all I must. With full transparency, I'd still be stressing about finishing my personal statement and studying for, for the FTTs, if not for all the resources that were given to me through the YMCA. Not only has the YMCA been able to grow upon my impacts as a person, or as a student, but also has allowed me to find my way towards a future path. As you've heard today and will continue to hear, this is not only a testament of how nonprofits such as the YMCA have helped me around Liberia, but how it's helped teens and young people all across the five boroughs. The YMCA is not only a gym, but it's a place I'm expired. for all teens across NYC and all young people across NYC. With this being said, such spheres should have funding to continue their impact and hope that with the YMCA being one of such spheres, we are able to overcome. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now call on Michael Rivadanira. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Rose and members of the Youth Service Committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Michael Rivadanera, Senior Director of Government Relations for the YMCA of Greater New York. I'm glad you had the opportunity to hear Shiana, Ryan, and Samir, three inspirational youth who have participated in several Y after school programs funded by DYCD and directly by the council, like Teens Take the City. Hearing the voices of these, those directly impacted by these decisions should be the ones heard and listened to. So I will not take much time and I'll summarize my testimony. I wanna recognize that 2020 brought us two pandemics, one that we have lived with for a long time, racial injustice and COVID-19, which has taken many friends and families from us. Throughout these pandemics, our youth have shown us how resilient they are. However, we should not take for granted their resi resiliency which is what the FY22 preliminary budget does. The mayor speaks of a recovery for all, but the FY22 preliminary budget neglects our youth in the recovery mandate he has instituted by completely eliminating Summer Sonic. A recovery for all must include all our youth from zero to young adult. Our youth need stability and consistency like the rest of us. We need fully funded, and more investments in age appropriate youth programming to keep our youth engaged, to re-engage them after a traumatic year and to give them opportunities to grow and succeed in life. COVID-19 response, respons um, COVID response initiatives such as Learning Lab and Learning Bridges should be extended through the summer and into the next school year to support DOE's effort to address student learning loss as well as their operational needs for space to safely accommodate learning. In order to successfully serve our youth and families this summer and the next school year, providers need to know that programs are fully funded by April. And we need to know as soon as possible DYCDs and DOE's expectations of providers, along with guidance on how to deliver these services safely as we transition into more in-person programming. Chair Rose, Thank you for being an outstanding advocate for our youth. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for oh, Thank you for your testimony. Uh, the second panel of public testimony in order of speaking will be 
Jorge Morales, Mariam Chaudhry, Carmen Lopez Villamilla, Tatiana Arguello, and Sarah Silverman. I will now call on Jorge Morales. Before we begin, I think Council Member Rosenthal is trying to get our attention. Oh. My apologies. Go ahead. No worries at all. I, I just wanted to say hello to um, Michael and all the students. Teens take uh, charge in, and teens take the city are some of my favorite uh, groups. I, when we were in person, I always loved welcoming um, the teens take the city uh, class to the chambers of the city hall and enjoyed seeing you all debate resolutions that you had prepared and then seeing how the votes have turned out. They surprised me. Um, and I just wanna share with you one that surprised me that's always stuck with me, which is whether or not we should have um, the uh, screens in schools, the security um, things that you walk through. Metal detectors. Thank you, Chair Rose. So, um, and I was sure this was going to be a slam dunk that we should eliminate them. And I heard both sides um, talk about it. And then the vote was pretty dispositive that we should keep the metal detectors, that students did not feel safe. Now, that, that really has put, that has really made me think and um, think twice about what I believe should happen compared to what those who have lived experience think should happen. And it's a great reminder for people to be, for adults, to be a little bit humble and step back and listen more. Um, it's helped me serve better as a council member what I've learned from you. So I really wanna congratulate you for participating in the program to all the students and hope that you, know, you continue to participate in civic ways as things move forward. And um, I'm excited and well, actually I won't be there, but I hope you're back in the chambers next spring um, debating on the floor again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Rose, for the minute to say that. Well, yeah, that's fine. Um, I, and, and I too want to add um, that I am so proud. Uh, I listened to the young people last night at the rally and um, they were articulate, they were passionate. They know what they want, they know what they need. And, and I want to thank you for, you know, being the impetus behind the fight. You know, and I want to thank all of the adult leaders and, and the um, committee for, um, for change, um, for all of the groups, all of the participants. And, and Michael, um, I didn't make the CCRB meeting last night because um, I just was so enamored with, the, with our young people that I thought that was uh, the place I needed to be. So thank you all. Thank you. I'm um, thanking all of the young people in advance of their testimony. Thank you for being here and waiting so long to, to um, testify. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rose, as well. Uh, we will now continue with the second panel, and I will call on Jorge Morales. Time starts now. Good afternoon to the Council's Youth Service Committee and to all of those watching this hearing. My name is Jorge Morales. I am a junior at the University of Rochester, and I am also a Teen State Charge alum and have been one of the leaders working on our SYEP advocacy. Uh, today, I am here once again to testify in regards to the Summer Youth Employment Program and to other crucial youth programming. Over the past couple of weeks, Teen State Charge and other stakeholders have been meeting to discuss the road to universal SYEP. Now more than ever, it seems like New York City is getting close to providing universal SYEP. Last week, Teen Sig Charge had, to, had all top mayoral candidates commit to universal SYEP within the first year of their administration, that being 2022. 
This is all really exciting and long overdue, but we look forward to incorporating more youth in the planning process of this program. That being said, Teens Take Charge have a responsibility to advocate for the youth. I do not have to remind you all of how bad the COVID-19 uh, has devastated New York City's youth. Many have been extremely disconnected and it is because of this that we expect an overwhelming demand for paid skilled building opportunities. Now more than ever, we need a robust plan that provides youth with paid opportunities to advance academically and professionally. I want to echo Public Advocates Williams' call for more than 70,000 slots. We believe that with a little creativity, we can serve at least 100,000 youth this year. How do we do it? We believe that there are a lot of, there's a lot of untapped capacity in our high school and colleges, which will already be offering summer classes to record numbers of youth. Let's give our schools who know their students best the chance to provide enriching paid school site internships and career readiness programming. In addition to DOE and CUNY, youth nonprofit and providers who do not currently host SYEP could help add the needed capacity for these additional spots. We appreciate the council's commitment for universal SYEP, but the commitment has to go beyond words. We need to make tangible progress towards that goal this year. We hope that you all are responsive to what the youth wants, deserves, and most importantly, needs. Young people just experience the worst year of their lives. In times like this, we must be creative and pull all of our resources to meet the youth's extenuating needs. Investing in our youth is not a cost, but rather an investment. An investment, not just to our youth, but to the future of our city. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jorge. I will now call on Miriam Chowdhury. Good morning. I'm Miriam Chowdhury. I'm a sophomore at the Young Women's Leadership School of the Bronx and a Teens Take Charge organizer, also a member for Project 1424. I testified in January when DYCD and a lot of you council members said you'd reach out to young people in the SYP planning process. We haven't heard anything from you in the last two months. I'm here to remind you that our voices matter in this process. We have needs and ideas. The most important and most basic is that we need jobs. 70,000 slots is not enough for this essential program. We have big dreams and we expect you to help us achieve them. I have big dreams that I will make into a big plan. I plan on attending college and working towards becoming a pediatric psychiatrist. Honestly, I'm not sure how I might do this though. I don't even know how to file my taxes and I have a long journey ahead of me. As a sophomore, I know there's so much ahead of me, but I'm not being taught how to conquer this. I have been turned down for jobs because I lack experience and SYP could have helped me with that. SYP could have helped me because it would have given me a chance to see and feel how it is to be employed. The pros and cons of working. SYP must be expanded because every student who wants to gain experience from SYP should be provided that opportunity. SYP would be so significant during this pandemic because there are so many families struggling as we speak and students can be helping their family out with the employment they are provided through SYP. As a person, a part, a part of a family with someone disabled in it, SYP can help me earn money so I can help and support my family. To reach my goal of becoming a pediatric psychiatrist, I need relevant work experience. SYP can help me by providing this. I lack experience in the work field. It's always nice to have some experience in the field you want to grow in. Internships at hospital or just being able to get the experience of working with kids will help me grow as a person. Every day we are in school being taught so many things, but I have no knowledge or experience of what, in what I have to do in order to become a pediatric psychiatrist. Internships and SYP can help me fill in that gap. Although there are many people helping to plan SYP this summer, you are far from guaranteeing that every teenager will be employed. I have yet to see any outreach within DYCD. It just gives up that the future of New York City is not important to you. As people who are supposed to guide you towards the right path, it is not evidently happening. If we don't start for change now, when will it start? We can't start when it's too late, then it will never happen. I hope everyone gains a better understanding of why SYP and employment matters to me. It is important for you to listen to us because we are the future of New York City. We are fighting to make the city better for everyone and expanding SYP is a start. Thank you, Miriam. I will now call on Carmen Lopez Villamil. Time you. starts now. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Carmen. Quick heads up, I'm in history, so if I get cold call, I'm out. 
But I just wanted to start by saying that Chair Rose and Councilmember Chin, I really appreciate that you name Universal SYEP as your primary goal. Um, and I'm excited for it to happen next year. I look forward to meeting with you guys and your colleagues about it in the next few weeks. And until then, we'll continue to fight for universal jobs. For me, a job means security and support. It means money for college tuition and something exciting to look forward to. It means connecting with my peers in a way that I haven't been able to for the last year of remote learning. For me and all of my peers, SYEP is an essential program. We've heard from providers that they do not have the capacity to reach universal this year, but that doesn't mean that our needs go away. We're going to apply for SYEP in record numbers this year because we need something meaningful to do. If you're gonna turn away youth because of capacity restrictions, youth who've gone out of their way to weave through lengthy applications just because they really want a job, you need to give us a backup. So here's my challenge to DOICD. This year, every young person who applies will receive support and opportunities from DYCD, even if it's not a paid job. This is what we're calling SYEP Unbound. Every young person who's not offered a paid slot should be automatically enrolled in SYEP Unbound, a suite of career exploration and development resources, expanded access to existing programs like Hats and Ladders and DYCD's Youth Town Halls, resume writing and financial literacy workshops. But we also need real credentialing options like the CUNY upskill model. We're talking about free access to Coursera or master classes. Give us a summer long opportunity to learn professional skills. I've seen the commissioner's outdated resource guides. An email with links is not enough for us. We need support for every youth who wants a job this summer. We need peer to peer conversations, panels with professionals and credentialing options. Like we've said many times before, youth, not just providers, should be involved at every stage of designing these experiences. I've loved watching the DYCD youth town halls, but let's do more. We will not let you leave any young person behind. We demand SYEP Unbound for every single kid who applies. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. I will now call on Tatiana Aguero. Time starts now. Good morning. I first want to thank Chair Rose and the City Council at large for championing and enjoying the baseline of SYEP for this fiscal year. My name is Tatiana Arguello. I am the Director of Workforce Development at United Activities Unlimited. We are one of the largest SYEP providers in New York City. I just want to use my time to highlight the situation on the grounds. Long before COVID-19, young adult poverty was on a rise with young people facing crippling college debt, high unemployment rates, stagnant wages, and increased high cost of living. It is no secret that young people will feel the impact of this pandemic-induced recession for decades to come and will bear the brunt of its economic consequences. Young people have been disproportionately impacted, facing extremely limited opportunities to telework, as many youth traditionally work in retail and, and hospitality, industries that have been severely impacted by COVID-19. Just as it was true during the 2008 Great Recessions for Millennials, members of Generation Z are experiencing elevated unemployment rates, lower e earnings, reduced net worths, decreased rates of savings, high levels of student loan debts, lower rates of home ownerships, loss of learning, and higher rates of co-residents with parents. I'm sure economists and other experts were right about the lasting effects of these generations and their trajectory. There will be some that will never recover from these loss. In many ways, our youth are also missing out on the human connection as we generally understand and seek it and are dealing with mental health. And all of this is not even to touch on the troubling statistics reflecting more severely negative impacting and a great uphill climb for people and households of color in all aspects of this crisis, employment, income, housing, security, food insecurity, health, and mortality. Programs like SYEP and Work, Learn, and Grow help to tackle these issues. As we know, young people are the future of America, of New York City's workforce and economy. We need to continue to fight for youth on workforce programming, including this coming year to avoid further damage that can cri cripple this generation. The asks are simple, an increase of PPP 
price per participant for providers to cover the true cost of OY programming, especially with this new proposed model, that so that we can actually see impact. A restoration and expansion of work, learn, grow to include all service models and a restoration of Sonic Summer. In light of this pandemic, we cannot overlook the employment and economic conditions of young people. We need to ease the pessimism about their futures, not with false optimism or superficial sentiments, but by changing the trajectory. We need to understand that there are new opportunities on the horizon, and it is our responsibility as a city to seize them, to bring them to light and to prepare our young people to be prepared to make the most of the opportunities yet to come. Time. Thank you <laughs> for the, the opportunity to testify. Thank you. I'll now call on Sarah Silverman. Thank Time you. starts now. I want to thank Chairwoman Rose and the Committee on Youth Services for the opportunity to testify. My name is Sarah Silverman, and I've been a participant in the Wildlife Conservation Society's Discovery Guide program since 2020. Each year, this program engages more than 500 young people. The Wildlife Conservation Society, WCS, has been able to adapt and maintain our diverse young offerings during a global pandemic. Our Career Lattice program provides WCS youth ages 14 to 24 with paid leadership opportunities that scaffold their professional experience and prepare them to transition into paid positions in WCS and our local communities. This program combines education, workforce development, networking, and outreach to increase opportunities for over 1,400 youth who work and learn at our five facilities, and now virtually due to COVID-19, with renewed support from the Speaker and City Council, WCS will be able to continue to provide a growing group of diverse young New Yorkers with the experience to build meaningful careers at our five parks and the skills to begin lifelong careers in STEM. Despite our parks closing to the public for five months due to the COVID-19 pandemic, WCS as an organization never stops serving the public and our youth. WCS Education continues to provide our Career Lattice members with health and emotional support, access to staff members, and an array of resources and more. We also continue to operate robust and engaging virtual programs and provide support for the over 600 part-time employees we will hire in 2021. Before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, I had planned my whole summer around joining the Discovery Guide program at the Central Park Zoo. Even though I wasn't able to be there in person, I was so grateful the program transitioned into a virtual experience or else I would have had absolutely nothing to do. I developed professionalism and communication skills and met an amazing group of peers. This program showed me how science and conservation can be intertwined in incredible ways and opened my eyes to careers I never knew were possible. Opportunities like the Discovery Guide program and other youth opportunities at WCS are critical for NYC youth and families that rely on them not only for income, but for first job experiences that teach us about the world, ourselves, and expand their network. I love this experience and can't wait to continue developing my career with additional opportunities from WCS. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'll now, the next panel of public testimony in order of speaking will be Ed, uh, Luis Fuentes, Daryl Hornick Becker, and Nora Moran. I will now call on Luis, Luis Fente, Fuentes. Time testify. starts now. Hello, everybody. My name is Luis Fuentes, and I'm the Senior Program Director for the Monterey Cornerstone. I have worked for Good Shepherd Services for 13 years, and during that time, I've been a group leader, team service coordinator, and now a director. Thank you, Chair Rose, and the members of the Committee on Youth Services for the opportunity to testify on after school during today's preliminary budget hearings. Last year, when the pandemic hit, I went from director to first responder. We supported the city in opening the regional enrichment centers, the grab and go mail centers, the learning labs, provided social and emotional supports to children and families, and supported educators and students with remote learning, and all the while while keeping children safe. This was all happening as Good Shepherd Services had to lay over 300 individuals as a result of the cuts that youth services experienced last year when the mayor eliminated all youth service programs. Those of us that remain had the impossible job of continuing to support families in the midst of a pandemic while mourning the loss of our colleagues and navigating the precautions of social distancing and wearing masks to keep both ourselves and the children and families we interact with daily safe. 
Last year, I participated in 16 Fun Youth NYC rallies to fight back the cuts. And just yesterday, I co-hosted the first round of Fun Youth NYC rallies to denounce the mayor's proposal to cut Sonic slots this summer in his preliminary budget. I'm here today to ask the council to negotiate a budget that includes Sonic slots for over 45,000 children who depend on supports and engagement now more than ever. Because, this uncertain, because there is still uncertainty, we are planning for both remote and in-person. We are considering new ways to have youth connect with each other. Last year, summer programs included a community engagement and salsa congress. During the school year, we had over 100 children grades 8 through 12 participate in Speak Up initiatives where kids gave back to the community. We provided virtual activities that help kids work on leadership skills, expose them to what civic engagement looks like in their communities, and created social and emotional connections among participants. The youth also learned about how to make their communities better during COVID. These experiences, these meaningful interactions, is what is at stake if the mayor is allowed to eliminate Sonic. I asked the council to help us restore these slots so we could plan accordingly. We need to stop the budget dance and the last minute negotiations that yield slots, which providers have to scramble to fill. Our parents deserve better. Our communities deserve the respect to plan ahead and not last minute. They have to schedule work and life and, their bud and the budget dance makes it very difficult for them. We need a decision to be made now and by the executive budget next month so we could plan and do not do the budget dance until June 30th. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you again, Chair Rose, she was with us out there in the rally. She's a champion then, and I know she's going to continue to be a champion. Thank you for your testimony, Lewis. I will now call on Daryl Hornick Becker. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Daryl Hornick Becker, and I am a policy associate at the Citizens Committee for Children of New York. I'd like to thank Chair Rose and all the members of the Youth Services Committee for holding today's hearing. In the past year, youth serving CBOs has help, have helped bridge the digital divide, supported working families, and addressed children's trauma and behavioral health needs. Summer camps and SYEP last year and after school and the Learning Bridges sites this year have played a significant role in keeping our schools, communities, and economy running during the pandemic. And they will be, a, and they will be vital to an equitable and lasting recovery. And yet, once again, youth programs are one of the first areas to be cut in the budget. It is shameful to ask CBOs to step up to the plate only to continually slash their budgets, handicap their programming, and throw the youth and communities they serve into disarray with last minute and partial restorations. It is well past time that the city remove children and families from the annual budget dance. First, the administration must restore summer sonic funding for middle school students and add and baseline funding for additional slots. The preliminary budget includes a $5.7 million cut to summer sonic programs for middle school students on top of the exclusion of one-time funding for the vast majority of spots. This means as it currently stands, the budget includes zero funding for Summer Sonic. Up until late February, middle school students were learning entirely remotely. These students will require the academic engagement and learning loss prevention that summer programs offer. It is imperative that the administration restores and baselines all funds for Summer Sonic, a total restoration of 25.7 million to fund 43,500 slots and that DYCD not be caught flat-footed and issue guidance now on how summer programs can be operated safely before restorations are in the budget. Second, the city should invest in SYEP to build towards universal access. It's important to note that in, in summer 2019, over 150,000 youth applied for spots and less than half received placement. To truly support employment opportunities for young people, DYCD should work with youth advocates to advance opportunities for applicants not selected in the lottery this summer and the administration and city council should begin to significantly invest and add spots to SYAP following the summer with the goal of universal, universal access next summer. Third, the administration must continue to support learning bridges and expedite background clearances for staff. Access to the learning bridges sites should expand to include students who attend charter schools. And if the sites will be operational either during the summer or next fall, the earlier these plans can be announced and funds made available, the better equipped providers can be. Lastly, it has always been an arduous process to have new staff cleared to work in youth programs, putting providers at a disability in their ability to scale up. And this has remained true throughout the pandemic. The administration, DYCD, and DOHMH must collaborate better on the clearance process and allow providers to onboard new staff in a timely manner. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. I will now be calling on Nora Moran. Time starts now. 
Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify this morning. My name is Nora Moran. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at United Neighborhood Houses. We are a policy organization representing New York City's 40 settlement houses located in all five boroughs. And these organizations really are leaders in the youth development field, working with young people in after school, SYP, Cornerstones, and Beacons. My written testimony is a lot more detail, um, but I'm gonna focus on just a couple issues here. Um, you know, we all know how challenging COVID-19 has been both for young people and for the staff who are working with them and supporting them. Uh, Community-based organizations have stepped up in amazing ways over the past year to provide emergency child care, to run learning labs when this program didn't exist, you know, mere months before. Um, and, you know, really went above and beyond to work with young people to make sure that they and their families were supported during COVID. We are in a much better place in this uh, FY22 preliminary budget than we were last year. Um, it's very promising that you know funding was restored for summer beacons, cornerstones, um, that there is money for SYP and for Compass, um, but there is one glaring exception and that is summer sonic funding. Um, we have done this budget dance year over year. We've heard providers talk about it. Um, right now in the preliminary budget, there is no funding uh, for those one-time uh, slots that we always come through. Um, and to add insult to injury, uh, this year there also was a new cut to the baseline that we had never seen before. Um, and as of right now, there is no summer sonic funding available uh, for this summer when middle school students have been learning remotely uh, throughout much of this year. And when we know that everybody is going to need support uh, to recover from the effects of the COVID pandemic, um, but especially middle school students. So we really urge uh, the mayor and the city council to settle summer sonic funding as soon as possible. It cannot go until the last minute. Providers need time to prepare, to find locations. Um, we need you know, the DOE to be coordinating in all of this to make sure that their sites are available. Um, and you know, we're calling for two things specifically, that that $5.7 million cut to the baseline be restored, um, and that there be an additional 20 million invested uh, for the 34,000 one-time slots that come through for Summer Sonic each year. Um, on the Summer Youth Employment Program, we are very glad um, that we're not repeating last year's mistakes and that there's funding in prelim for 70,000 slots. Um, UNH is thrilled that we are on a path to universal SYP and look forward to working with everybody to get there next year. Um, and we are you know, definitely uh, very uh, supportive of the SYP Unbound idea. Um, we think it's a great way to make sure that more youth are served this summer um, and you know, in, in different and new ways. Um, and finally, want to echo uh, my colleague uh, Daryl's comments about comprehensive background checks. This continues to be an issue, and we really need to make sure that uh, if Summer Sonic, is, if and when Summer Sonic is restored, um, that DOHMH has the capacity to clear people quickly um, and make sure that uh, you know background checks are done uh, quickly so that staff can be uh, hired for summer camp. Time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The fourth panel of public testimony in order of speaking will be Alicia Govera, Ma'am Fatou Ducare, Abraham Velasquez, and Nicole Hamilton. I'll now call on Alicia Govera to testify. Time starts now. Alicia, are you available? Okay, I'm muted now. Thank you, Committee Chair Rose, and to the members of the New York City Council for holding this very important hearing on youth services. My name is Alicia Guevara, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer at Big Brothers Big Sisters of New York City, the nation's first and New York City's largest youth mentoring organization. And today, I come before you to advocate on behalf of the thousands of children and youth that uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters serves each year across the five boroughs of New York City. Youth who continue to experience disruptions to supports and services due to the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. And while Big Brothers Big Sisters of New York City has been able to pivot during this time to continue meeting the needs of our youth, their families and our, our volunteer mentors, we know that this would not have been possible without the generous support of the New York City Council and our broader community of stakeholders. So many programs have been discontinued or defunded. And as the city's conversations 
turn to recovery, it's critically important that we center young people, focusing our attention on shoring of the resources and supports that enable them to realize their biggest possible futures. It certainly has been an unimaginable year and we know the littles in our community are experiencing the impacts of the pandemic in an even more pronounced way. A quarter of the young people we serve live in neighborhoods most heavily impacted by COVID-19. Close to 89% of our youth identify as Black or Latinx, two communities that continue to bear the brunt of learning loss, personal loss, economic strife, health disparities, and the digital divide. These realities reinforce the urgency of mentoring as an essential support for young people across the five boroughs. Since moving to a remote environment last March, I'm proud to share that over 85% of our mentor matches were together, that were together before the onset of COVID-19 remain matched today. That even in the face of tremendous personal changes experienced since last March, so many of our mentors opted in when it would have been much easier or convenient for them to opt out of mentorship. And this is what a commitment to building a better, more equitable, more connected city means. It means ensuring that the needs of our youth, their voices, their talents, and their potential are amplified and uplifted, not pushed to the side or deferred. In the case of Big Brothers Big Sisters of New York City, we center youth by matching them with compassionate, caring adult mentors who stand for them and for igniting their potential. It's imperative that the New York City Council restores not just the full funding of our organization, but all other programs that provide essential services to young people in our city. These essential supports, including mentoring, will not only mitigate the immediate impacts of the pandemic, but also ensure our young people are set up for long-term success and Time. therefore ensure New York City's future. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Big Brothers Big Sisters and the children and young people across the city of New York. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now be calling on Ma'am Fatou Ducure. Time starts now. My name is Ma'am Fatou Ducure and I am a youth organizer at the Brotherhood and Sister Soul. It is, it's upsetting me that we, sh we have to attend hearings to demand a police free school, fully fund school only to see that our city budget continue to fund the criminalization of NYC students. We who care about the wellness of marginalized students in New York City do not believe in the super, super special transfer of school safety agents from the NYPD to the DOE. We do not believe that the city budget should continue to underfund our school and community. To address issues worsened by COVID-19, we have to find money to create meaningful shift in our education system and instead of create pathway to students, student success. They will, this will require police free schools, failure to divest from schools, and invest in student success will mean that our city continue to fail us youth. Our city does, does not do enough to ensure that our schools are fully funded and fully resource, resourced as so, so as to meet the need of all students. We need to remove all police present, whether under the DOE or NYPD. And shift and shift those shift those funds to actually offer mental health support and overall support for all young people, including SYEP. None of the schools I have attended have the resources that for mental health support. In my current school, every teacher has the role of advisory, but how but we have no guardian counselor or therapy. And I have not had any support to prepare for college either. In school, not only do I feel like I'm being spent on, but I feel criminalized as if the SSAs are just waiting for me to make one mistake to get us in big trouble. Additionally, a lot of peers 
and I have other negative inter interaction with the SSAs. The presence of police in our school comes at cost of having actual student support. This this paired with the with the disproportion <laughs> and the negative impact schools have on police has on school students who are low income, black and Latinx, means that we are more likely to be the subject of time expired discipline. And the police respond at the school, at school that their white peers continue to fund police and policing culture in our school will make it clear that this is an issue of lack of pol pol policy political will. We young people are closest to the problem and therefore you, you need to hear us when we offer a solution. You all have to have the power to meaningfully shift the fund from the police, reinvest in our community, but this requires radical action beginning with the budget. To meet the demands of the people who took the street and the organizers now in the room, you have to end the criminalization of you and students of color while deconstructing the school to prison pipeline. And you must do it now. Join us or be part of the problem. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now be calling on Abraham Velasquez. Time starts now. Afternoon, Chair Rose and City Council members. My name is Abraham Velasquez, and I'm an educator and organizer of the Brotherhood Sister Soul. For more than 25 years, the Brotherhood Sister Soul, BROSIS, has been at the forefront of social justice, educating, organizing, and training to challenge inequity and create opportunity for all. With a focus on Black and Latinx youth, BROSIS is where young people claim the power of their history, identity, and community to build the future they want to see. BROSIS youth have a vision for education in New York City that includes safe, restorative, healing environments where all students have the opportunity to learn and grow. To meet this goal, the City Council must pursue legislation that values and respects the dignity of students, caregivers, and their communities. This requires funding SYEP, which we're grateful for, providing schools equitable resources, adopting a culturally responsive curriculum, preventing trauma, repairing harm, and promoting restorative practices. The budget passed this year has to reflect this vision. Today, New York City is far from where it needs to be to ensure student success as our schools face troubling realities. School segregation leads to chronic underfunding of schools in New York State, which has negative and disparate impacts for Black, Latinx, and low-income students, giving subsequent resource disparity. Only 77.3% of the 1.1 million children in the DOE system will graduate on time, and only 55% of New York City high school graduates will graduate college-ready. One in 10 NYC public school students is homeless, houseless. Additionally, in a nation in which 14 million students are in schools with police, but no counselors, nurse, psychologists, or social workers, New York City has more school safety agents, SSAs, than any other district in the United States. The presence of police in our schools has disproportionately impacted students who are low income, Black and Latinx, who are more likely to be the subject of exclusionary discipline and police presence at school than their white peers. Everyone in the city council, however, has the power to shift this, beginning with meaningfully shifting funds from the police, reforming their responsibilities, and reinvesting in our communities. We must deconstruct the school to prison pipeline and broken windows policing and truly decriminalize low level offenses that lead to our youth having negative contact with the state and carceral systems. And we must do this now. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Nicole Hamilton. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rose and members of the 
of and staff of the Committee of the Youth Service Youth Services for the opportunity to testify. My name is Nicole Hamilton, and I am currently the Director of Community Partnerships at Girls for Gender Equity, or GGE. I previously served as the Director of Urban Leaders Academy, GGE's social justice-based after-school programs for almost 10 years. I am testifying today in strong support of returning full funding to the Department of Youth and Community Development, and to speak specifically to concerning trends of outsourcing youth work to the NYPD. Almost exactly one year ago today, GGE convened a Zoom call of over 100 youth service providers, educators, city agency employees, mental health professionals, social workers, and others out of a necessity in rapid response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the upheaval that it caused. Here we are almost a year later, still holding that space to support this dynamic group of people who love, serve, and support young people day in and day out. DYCD is facing continued and disproportional divestment. We thank council for your leadership in preserving SYP in some form after the mayor proposed its cancellation in FY21. And we thank the council for the stated commitment to returning SYP slots for the summer of 2021. However, we are concerned that the funding for SYP falls short of sustaining SYP in its entirety as funding for FY22 is just 75% of what it was in FY20. Further funding for DYCD in FY22 is $200 million less than what it was in FY20, $200 million less. Young people are severely impacted by these cuts because they take away the vital resources that they need, as you have heard testimony after testimony today, while continuing to siphon these funds into the budget of the NYPD. Young people are watching and listening and they will not forget that their cries for the city to stop criminalizing, dehumanizing and traumatizing them day in and day out by the ever looming presence of police that have, have been consistently ignored. They will not forget that the city sends officers who wield the power to enact deadly force into their schools and onto their playgrounds and into their train stations and their bodegas and their youth programs and into the very buildings where they live. Despite their outrage and pleas, the city doubles down and finds even more ways to give the NYPD access and portals into the lives of young people. We know that quality programs are a protective factor in the lives of many young people, yet it seems that the city is willing to forfeit their protection in order to bolster the budget of the NYPD, who are ironically called to serve and protect, and they often do the opposite. We call on the council to invest in programs that build skills, cultivate communities, heal past harms, spark inquisitiveness, value individuals for what they bring, validate, affirm, connect, uplift, and support. In addition, the public needs full transparency about the current relationships with, the bud with their budgetary impact. Time expired. DYCD and NYPD. We heard this morning that DYCD collaborated with the NYPD at Police Academy to start up a new youth coordination officer program, endorsing the use of police as DYCD outreach strategy. This is outrageous. Young people must be able to be outside, play, and have joyful, everyday, youthful experiences without police intervention. The mayor's March 5th police reform and reinvention proposal expands on what we've seen in our communities, the tangling together of youth programming and policing. With SYEP, for example, we understand that NYPD is one of the larger SYEP work sites where youth are placed in local precincts, one police plaza, and other NYP units and commands. The city has created devious and secretive partnerships between the NYPD and DYCD, forcing young people to interact with police at Beacon and Cornerstone Centers and DYCD contracted youth serving organizations. What's worse, the, the patrol guide is continuously and outrageously adapted so that police are instructed to perform a myriad of tasks with the intent of insidiously infiltrating youth spaces just so that they can stay in close proximity to young people, even when young people themselves have stated that they are not welcome. And let's face it, those jobs rightfully belong to other people, people without the legal authority to use physical and deadly force to carry with them the threat of imminent criminalization. Those jobs belong to food service workers, restorative justice practitioners, counselors, school nurses, parent coordinators, and a long list of other positions that are severely understaffed and also require specific skill sets and levels of expertise and experience in youth development. The NYPD's intelligence-driven policing model- Can you model, begin to wrap up? Can you begin to wrap up? Okay. Last sentence, absolutely. Thank you so much for the extension. The NYPD's intelligence-driven policing model is information sharing practices across city agencies. Its omnipresence and surveillance infrastructure make it clear and apparent and imperative that DYCD must be free from the NYPD. 
thank you so much for the opportunity to testify and the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now begin calling on the next panel for public testimony. Our speakers in order will be Shuk Cheng, a representative of Reach Out and Read of Greater New York, Emily Gertz, Kaveri Sengupta, Shamar Watson, and Judy Ling. I will now call on Shuk Cheng to testify. Time starts now. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Rose and member of the City Council for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Shukin Chen, and I oversee one of the many after-school programs CPC provides across the city. CPC stands for Chinese American Planning Council, Inc. Briefly, our mission is to promote social and economic empowerment of Chinese American immigrants and low-income communities. My program is called Learn and Earn. It is a three-year program for high school juniors, seniors, and college freshmen. Our youth from low-income families our youth are from low-income families with income threshold that fall within the U.S. federal poverty guideline. Many, of, many will be um, the first in the family to go to college and majority Asian. We provide enrichment workshops, which most schools do not offer, including but not limited to financial literacy, cooking, art and craft, mental health and well-being, college and work readiness, professional etiquette, and mentorship opportunities. COVID-19 exacerbated the income disparity and education gap of our youth and their families. Our after-school program turned into essential services due to high demands for assistance in unemployment benefits, rent relief applications, scheduling, vaccination appointments, and translation services. With limited staff, we scrambled to also help youth coping with xenophobia, old technology frustration, Zoom burnout, and an increase in anxiety, panic attacks, and depression. As COVID subsides, mental health among our youth will take precedence. Although mental health cannot be seen, trauma is not to be taken lightly. With anti-Asian crimes uh, increased 150% in 2020, mostly in New York and Los Angeles, we will have an, ex an even longer adverse it will have an even longer adverse impact than the education disparity and learning loss we are experiencing, if not addressed immediately. Asians is the fastest growing population in the country and in the state of New York. I am not sure if it weren't for after school programs like Learn and Earn and the largest Asian social service like CPC, where and who our community members turn to. Please help our community members by continue to support the essential works we do day in and day out. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on the representative from Reach Out, Teach Out. Time starts now. Yeah, and read of. Hi, do you mean Reach Out and Read? So sorry. I'm sorry, I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. I just want to make sure. Uh, I was just asked to unmute. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to testify here today. Um, I am here uh, representing Reach Out and Read of Greater New York as the program director. Um, and we want to take this moment to testify on behalf of uh, supporting City's First Readers, um, the Early Literacy Initiative. Um, thank you so much to the speaker and the city council members for their ongoing commitment to ensuring that New York City children who participate in our program will begin school with the literacy skills that will enable them to succeed. As many of uh, people know here, um, more than half of New York City public school third graders read below grade level. Um, and this problem is even bigger in the communities of concentrated poverty. Um, but we know that it starts before they enter school. Um, and that's really where City's First Readers comes in. We wanna prevent that from happening uh, to begin with. Um, it's also important to note that the return on investment for high quality early childhood education programs is cited at 13%. So that is a significant uh, gain there. So Reach Out and Read of Greater New York for 20 years has partnered with healthcare providers, um, which has been even more imperative during the times of COVID-19, um, to put books and literacy resources in the hands of children and their caregivers. 
During regular pediatric checkups, our pediatricians and other pediatric providers provide uh, new developmentally appropriate books for children ages birth to five and guidance um, to their parents and caregivers about the importance of reading aloud and literacy. Many of the resources that we provide to families at these visits are connections with our city's first readers partners organizations who we know will continue to further the early childhood education support we give at these pediatric checkups. We partner with 170 of these hospitals, clinics, and care sites in New York City, and in 2020, we served over 255,000 children. Another piece that came out um, in the last year of our work uh, with schools and libraries being closed, we, uh, for a period of time, we knew that the majority of um, kids were not having access to books, but our programming at Reach Out and Read never stopped, and that's largely due to the funding that we've received from city council. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic provided us with an opportunity to partner with New York City Health and Hospitals Test and Trace Corps, um, where we trained their resource navigators to deliver early literacy guidance as they were getting tested for COVID, as well as provide them uh, with new uh, books for children. And then additionally, as a team with City's First Readers, we came together to provide books, crayons, art supplies, activity sheets, and more for um, the test and trace take care kits for families who test positive for COVID. So in addition to getting um, the PPE that they need, they were also receiving um, educational materials for their children. I'm expired. Can finish your sentence. Okay, <laughs> and that was it. So oh. thank you so much. Um, we just we really appreciate the opportunity, and we feel honored to be a member of City's First Readers. Um, and we uh, hope that it continues to be funded. It's such a vital source for our littlest New Yorkers. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now be calling on Emily Gertz. Time starts now. Thank you very much. I had a little trouble unmuting. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chair Rose and committee members for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Emily Gertz and I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives at Literacy Inc. We are a program partner and the managing organization for the New York City Council's Early Literacy Initiative, City's First Readers. City's First Readers includes 15 active partners that work in all 51 council districts to create equity of opportunity for children under five who are affected by systemic poverty. Annually, as a coalition, we support 1 million families, providing them with critical early learning programming that ensures all New York City children have a solid foundation to start school successfully, thrive academically, and succeed beyond their school years. Continued funding for City's First Readers in fiscal year 22 is essential because equity results from access and opportunity. For far too long, investments are made in communities after problems are so endemic that change feels impossible. Early literacy is a preventative measure and prevention beats intervention every time. City's First Readers helps families engage in critical pre-literacy activities like singing, talking, playing, and reading together that allow children to enter school prepared to succeed. Instead of starting behind and trying to catch up to their wealthier cohorts, with support from City's First Readers, low-income children are on par for academic success from the start. The impact of City's First Readers does not end there. Early literacy has a multiplying effect because literacy skills are strong predictors of improved health outcomes, civic engagement, economic self-sufficiency. Literacy increases graduation rates and decreases the school to prison pipeline. In essence, invest investments in early literacy today result in a strong society years down the road. As we all know, COVID, the COVID pandemic has impacted communities across the globe and there's been considerable attention to the tumultuous year of learning for school-aged children and teens. What has not been in the forefront is, is COVID's impact on the learning needs of infants, toddlers, and young children. City's First Readers partners know that children birth to five have been greatly impacted by the stress their families feel and by the isolation and limited access to community programming. We actually saw an increase in families' appetite for early literacy support over the last year, as parents needed even more guidance on how to keep their littlest learners stimulated and thriving. Our families didn't have the luxury to pause or slow down in the face of the health crisis, and neither did we. Despite the challenge, we still exceeded and met our deliverables for the year. The New York City Council, such as, sorry, 200,000 books 
270,000 books distributed, training 1,000 early literacy professionals, and delivering more than 355,000 remote learning opportunities. The City Council took decisive action in 2014 to address the literacy crisis facing New York, and we uh, request continued funding for fiscal year 22. Early literacy is not just important, it is a key to unlocking equity because early literacy is a Time racial expired. justice issue, an anti-poverty issue, an education issue, a health issue, and a social justice issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Kaveri Sengupta. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Kaveri Sengupta, and I am the Education Policy Coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, or CACF. Thank you so much to Chair Rose and members of the Committee on uh, Youth Services for giving us this opportunity to testify. CACF is the nation's only pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization and leads the fight for improved and equitable policies, systems, funding, and services to support those in need. CACF also leads the 15% and Growing Campaign, which is a group of over 45 Asian-led and serving organizations that work together to fight for a fair, inclusive, equitable New York City budget that protects the most vulnerable Asian Pacific American New Yorkers. Two of our campaign members include the Chinese American Planning Council and Immigrant Social Services who are testifying today. Currently, the APA community is by percentage the fastest growing group in New York City, nearly doubling every decade since 1970 and making up 15% of the population. Unfortunately, current levels of public funding for the APA community remain disproportionate to our community's needs. In, in fiscal year 2021, Asian-led and serving organizations received only 4.65% of city council discretionary dollars and less than 1.5% of social service contract dollars. 15% and growing campaign members employ thousands of New Yorkers and serve hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers. Many provide essential youth services around college and career readiness, mental health, social and emotional learning, and other areas to the 27.9% of all APAs in New York City who are under the age of 18. They need fair and equitable funding to continue to provide language accessible and culturally responsive services for our youth. While APAs have a high school graduation rate at 80%, the percentage of college and career ready students is significantly lower at about 50%. Other important statistics to note, particularly as part of DYCD's mission is to alleviate the effects of poverty. Nearly a quarter of APAs in New York City live in poverty, which is actually the highest poverty rate across all racial and ethnic groups. APAs in New York City also have the highest poverty gap or intensity of poverty. Our organizations and young people need investment in culturally responsive and language accessible youth services, which are, without which many immigrant young people in particular can find themselves isolated and marginalized, facing continued barriers to navigating systems and accessing, criti and accessing critical services that would provide them on the path to being a competent and responsible adults. These needs have only intensified as a result of the pandemic, which has further isolated so many of our APA young people who have contended with an enormous disruption to their education, heightened mental health challenges, and ongoing fears regarding racism. They deserve a budget that prioritizes them. This means investing in them by funding programs we know provide them with comprehensive supports and opportunities. Our priorities include baselines to Sonic and SYAP and restorations of baselines to work, learn, grow. And we're happy to see funding allocated for many of these necessary programs. However, as discussed, it is incredibly worrying to see that the mayor's budget, a moral document, has deemed that sonic programming is unnecessary during a pandemic that has done so much harm to our young people. We recommend a baseline $20.35 million in funding for sonic. I'm mixed by it. These initiatives are critical to the well being of APA young people to provide them with safe and supportive environments to explore their interests and passions and to ensure that their families are able to re enter the workforce. This is especially important for Asian Americans who, during the height of the pandemic, have experienced the largest increase in joblessness of all major racial groups in New York City with an unemployment rate of 25.6% as of May 2020. Our communities are consistently overlooked in the distribution of resources, which is harmful to us as well as to other communities of color who are denied the same resources due to the perceived success of APAs. This pandemic has highlighted a myriad of holes in our city, city, city safety net systems, excuse me, and the city's response must address root problems in addition to immediate needs. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now call on Shamar Watson. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chair Rose and the members of the Committee on Youth Services for the opportunity to present testimony today. My name is Shamar Watson, and I'm the Director of Youth Services for the Committee for Hispanic Children and Families, better known by its acronym CHCF. At the onset of the pandemic and the state shutdown, 
community-based organizations like CATF rapidly adjusted their services to ensure continuity and the delivery of the essential support that we offer to our students, families, and communities. During a typical school year, our school-based programs are funded through both state and city dollars to reach nearly 800 students and their families in the Bronx. Our community empowerment department expands our general reach of supports in those communities through additional workshops that are open to all beyond those involved in our school-based programs on a number of issues reflective of the shifting and holistic needs. With the pandemic, our school-based program staff have worked closely with our school leaders to meet the needs of students and families, even beyond those we are funded for, offering language access support, support accessing DOE devices and technical assistance, and offering the opportunity to join virtual activities to combat the effects of quarantine on physical and mental health. An additional city program that CATF has continued to proudly participate in while adjusting to the realities of the pandemic is Cities First Readers. Cities First Readers, um, better known as CFR, is a collaboration of nonprofit organizations fostering the literacy development of New York City children ages zero to five. Families living in poverty have been devastated by COVID-19 ensuring that even more low-income children find it difficult to reach proficiency by third grade. The need for City's First Readers programming has never been greater. Children and families have been isolated for more than one year with limited access to the pre-literacy support. Only City's First Reader has the capacity to engage these families to reverse this deprivation and prevent the long-term consequences from hobbling a generation of learners. We join our CFR partners in calling on the city council to acknowledge the severity of this crisis and their commitment to addressing it by supporting the city's first readers and investing $4.6 million to extend reach and impact of this valuable program. We call on this committee to continue supporting and growing the programs that we know work. With the anticipated long-term effects of the pandemic on social emotional well-being and educational growth for our most vulnerable young children and school-age learners, it is essential that programs like City First Readers and Extended Learning Time Programming and the culturally and linguistically responsive CBOs who deliver them are funded to thrive and grow and reach. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now call on Judy Ling. Time starts now. Thank you for, uh, thank you, Chair Rose and Community on Youth Services for giving us a chance to testify today. My name is Judy Ling and I am a certified school counselor currently working at Immigrant Social Services, ISS. Since 1972, ISS is dedicated to improving the conditions and promoting the welfare of our community in the Chinatown and Lower East Side area of New York City. ISS has worked extensively with immigrant children and their families, many of whom are from low income households with limited English proficiency. We partner with schools to provide enrichment, academic support, and prevention through OASIS, but it has been extremely difficult, especially during the pandemic, because there's just so much we can do without adequate support from the city. Nearly 50% of our Pan-Asian population in New York City lives in the hardest hit areas during the pandemic. But for fiscal year 2021, Asian-led and serving organizations only receive 4.65% of city council's discretionary funding, when we make up 15% of the population in New York City. The purpose of the 15% and growing campaign was so we could receive 15% of the discretionary dollars, which correlates to the population size. So the first citywide initiative the city should expand on is mental health services for our young people. To do that, the DOE needs to lift the current hiring freezes. Schools are already understaffed, especially when it comes to the people personnel services. COVID-19 is a traumatic experience. So now more than ever, students and families need social emotional support. I chose to be a school counselor so I could give back to my community, but was appalled that I wasn't even given a chance to a job interview, not because I didn't have the skill set, but because I was born too late to be in the field. Just simply applying SEL in schools is not enough. You need PPS to help address crises. Teachers are not trained like we are, and they already burned out and overworked. Also, adequate language access needs to be in place in, to provide mental health resources related to COVID-19, since a lot of our APA population have limited English proficiency. COVID-19 is a traumatic experience, and it is crucial for our young people to, uh, to have support to process it and work through it. Adults have some skill sets to cope with the pandemic, but still struggles. So imagine how much worse it is for our youth who speaks English and the ones who don't. 
Mental health resources are great for our youth, but doesn't mean anything if it is not linguistically or culturally appropriate. It also doesn't help that there are anti-Asian crimes in the midst of the pandemic. Youth need us to support them, and we cannot, but we cannot support them without adequate funding. ISS is at limited capacity, scrambling to help and going above and beyond, but there is so much we, but there's just so much we could do with all these budget cuts. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your thank you for your testimony for our fifth sixth panel of public testimony the order of speaking will be jane r biggleson polina ostrinkova amy wilkerson a representative from safe horizon and damian samuels samuels i will now call on jane biggleson to testify time starts now hello my name is Jane Biggleson, and I'm the Vice President of Advocacy at Covenant House New York, where we serve young adults experiencing homelessness and human trafficking. Thank you so much, Council Chair Rose, as well as the committee for the opportunity to testify today. We're obviously aware that we're in the midst of a global pandemic and that funding is tight. However, we also know that the most vulnerable among us are faring the worst. And at Covenant House New York and the other RHY programs across the city, the most vulnerable among us are exactly who we serve. Young people without homes and little to no safety net before they reach our doors. We beg you not to forget our youth and staff in the New York City budget process. First and foremost, we are asking that our frontline staff be paid a living wage. Unfortunately, cost of living increases for RHY staff under city contracts have been few and far between. It is simply unacceptable for essential workers who have been risking their own lives every day in this pandemic to serve others, to be needing to juggle multiple jobs just to survive. We're therefore asking for a minimum, a 3% COLA on all RHY contracts across the city, as well as an increase to right-sized contracts to better reflect the true cost of, of bed. Additionally, the mental health needs of our young people have skyrocketed during this pandemic. We've had to make mental health care more readily available. And we're doing everything in our power and asking our private donors for more in a time where anyone has, everyone has less to give, but we simply can't do it without the city's support. Additionally, a large number of our young people have lost jobs during COVID and many of their job and educational programs have shifted online and some have been closed. Our workforce development team has done a great job in shifting focus to getting our, helping our young people find jobs where they can be safe in this pandemic, but all of that has come at an increased cost. Finally, onto human trafficking. Recent research has demonstrated that one in five of our young people have had experiences that fit the federal definition of human trafficking or commercial sexual exploitation. And these young people have also struggled during this pandemic with many losing jobs, which makes it more likely that they'll return to the life of prostitution. To end on a positive note though, we are in the midst of relocating our safe house, which is currently in Long Island to the Bronx. And we're all very excited about that, but that is also going to come and increase costs. So we're grateful to the New York City Council, especially to Chair Rose, who's been an active supporter of our young people. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Polina Ostrinkova. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Polina Ostrinkova, and I'm going to speak on behalf of Covenant House New York as a client and a survivor of commercial sexual exploitation. I'd like to share my story and opinion to show the importance of um, running my homeless youth programs and others like them for young people like me. I'm grateful for the opportunity to testify today at the Voice of Traffic Youth. Uh, I'll begin my story. I left uh, home and family due to extreme tension that made it impossible to continue to live there. Um, once in the US, I met a young man who I thought was uh, my boyfriend and who I believed wanted the best for me. Unfortunately, I was involved in commercial sex and had to commit non-prostitution crimes. As a result, I ended up in jail and my trafficker did not. Uh, this experience had traumatized me a lot, but I'm so grateful uh, for the help of the Legal Aid Society. 
they did a great job defending me. So I was released from jail, but I had no idea whether I would be able to live a normal life until my case was closed. Uh, after I was released, my first connection became Restoring My Sea, which helps victims of human trafficking. Restore did a wonderful uh, job and later referred me to the Covenant House New York. I'm now at the Aspire program, and this is a safe house program for uh, uh, trafficked girls uh, where they are able to recover from their trauma. And now I wanted to speak shortly about services that Covenant House provides and why do we need them. Uh, first is a workforce development. Workforce development programs for clients of um, Covenant House are especially important because we get to learn more and apply for schools and colleges. Mental health is also a huge concern as young adults may feel anxious, desperate and triggered by their trauma. Without mental health care, desperate youth will continue to, to be plagued by depression, anxiety and PTSD. Uh, legal... Uh, Legal assistance. Free legal services helped me to get on my feet and Covenant House New York has only one attorney and needs more. Uh, speaking about anti-trafficking programs, uh, since trafficking is a hard thing to stop and exploiters have great skills uh, manipulating people and recruit vulnerable people as and LGBTQ plus youth. And with the year of the pandemic, the situation become even worse. Uh, Covenant House has been fighting trafficking and homelessness for decades, and for the past year I haven't had to worry about the place to stay, food, and etc. I also have been getting an incentive to cover my own needs and to learn how to budget my money. I was able to leave my bad experience behind and focus on the future. I asked City Council to make sure that New York City are expired use shelters like Covenant House as well as the other nonprofits. Uh, because if there were no charities like Cavern and House, there wouldn't be me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your testimony, Paulina. I will now call on Amy Wilkerson to testify. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Wilkerson. I'm the Vice President of School and Youth Programs at Sheltering Arms Children and Family Services. Thank you, Chair Rose and members of the committee on youth services for the opportunity to testify before you today. Sheltering Arms is one of the largest providers of education, youth and community and family well-being programs for Bronx, Manhattan, Brooklyn and Queens. We serve nearly 15,000 children, youth and families each year and we employ more than 1,100 staff. We are a leading provider in after school programming as well as runaway and homeless youth services. Um, I would like to first start by um, thanking the council for their long support in restoring funding for summer programs each year. Um, and after the stress of what we experienced last year and what families and providers experienced, um, we were hopeful that this summer funding for youth would be prioritized, um, especially as the con city continues to move forward towards recovery and reopening schools. However, um, unfortunately, we're here again where we have zero funding for Sonic Middle School programs. Um, we know it's a tough budget year for the council and for the mayor, uh, but these programs are vital to the success of, of children and youth in New York City. And um, providers like Sheltering Arms have been able to provide safely in person um, uh, sonic programming and um, compass programming throughout the pandemic. We've been able to do so with um, more than 120 children at five elementary schools just this semester. Um, and we're hopeful um, that council will restore funding for Sonic Middle Schoolers in this budget. Um, next, I would like to talk about our runaway and homeless youth programming. Um, the, as my colleague from Covenant House stated, it is very important um, that we right size the funding for runaway and homeless youth contracts. Um, the, the current budget amount that we are allocated does not fully fund the services that we provide. Um, and we're asking for uh, council to take a look at how runaway and homeless youth um, programs are funded and to come up with a better metric to right size the funding. Um, next, I wanna talk about um, our homeless youth between the ages of 21 and 24. As the provider of two drop-in centers, um, as well as crisis shelter and two transitional independent living programs, we are very aware that 21 to 24 year olds 
are um, uh, using drop-in services is because they're afraid to go into adult homeless shelters. So we're asking to add additional beds to the 21 to 24 year olds. And we're also asking for mental health supports to be added to our programming. We're seeing an increase of mental health needs in, a, in, a, in the participants that we serve, and we need more funding to be able to better meet their needs. And next we're asking if we can um, hold harmless providers for the- um, Time expired. Problematic underutilization that took place as a result of the pandemic. We were forced to make changes to our services, to our in-person services with limited amount of um, participants we can serve. And we're asked that we'll be held harmless uh, to that. And I'm being, I'm out of time. I just wanna um, fast forward and ask that um, we look at the restoration of the indirect rate. Um, this is critical to the survival of nonprofit organizations. And we ask that a redirect, um, indirect rate is completely restored in this budget. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on the representative from Safe Horizon. Time starts now. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today regarding the youth services portion of the fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget. My name is Joe Westmacott, and I'm the Assistant Director of Housing and Benefits Resources at Safe Horizon Street Work Project. Safe Horizon is the nation's largest nonprofit victim services organization. Safe Horizon offers a client-centered trauma-informed response to 250,000 New Yorkers each year who have experienced violence or abuse. And we are increasingly using an anti-racist lens to guide our work with clients, with each other, and in developing the public positions that we hold. Whether we are called on to provide expert testimony at an oversight hearing or to assist a constituent in, in crisis and in need of emergency services, we are pleased to partner with the city council in a collective effort to make our city safer for all. We look forward to helping you and your staff learn how best to support survivors and connect them to the resources available in your borough and community. Over many years, the city council has been a key supporter of our programs, helping adult, adolescent, and child victims of violence and abuse. City council funding fills in gaps where no other financial support exists and allows us to draw down critical dollars from other sources. Moreover, this funding demonstrates the value that you and your colleagues place in helping young people access desperately needed shelter, support services, legal assistance, and counseling. My testimony today will provide an update to the Youth Services Committee on one key initiative that is funded by the City Council and contracted through the Department of Youth and Community Development. This initiative, the Support for Persons Involved in the Sex Trade, provides critical funding to Safe Horizon Street Work Project. Street Work provides shelter, showers, hot meals, therapy, service linkage, safer sex supports, case management, and more, and therapeutic harm reduction communities serving homeless youth ages 13 to 25. We work with homeless and street involved young people to help them find safety and stability. Many homeless young people face a day-to-day -day struggle to survive, which can lead to physical and emotional harm. Homeless youth may have experienced family abuse, violence, rejection, and instability that led to their homelessness. We welcome these young people, help them to navigate complex systems, and provide essential resources at our drop-in centers, at our overnight shelter, and through our street outreach team. This work can be incredibly challenging, but also rewarding. Our work at Street Work did not pause during this pandemic. Rather, our dedicated team continued to respond to homeless and at-risk young people in need of shelter, services, and understanding. Safe Horizon Street Work Project has been doing this community-based work since 1984, and we will continue to do so for as long as our services are needed. Beginning in fiscal year 2020, the City Council designated $456,697 through the Support for Persons Involved in the Sex Trade Initiative to bolster Street Works' ability to provide services and access to housing to young people engaged in the sex trade. With this funding, we have been able to increase our engagement and response to the number of young people both in the drop-in center and on the streets who are crisis who are in crisis and involved in the sex trade and to connect them to supportive counseling, access to benefits and housing and primary and mental health care. Safe Horizon is seeking a full restoration of the $496,697 to continue to bolster our response and offer critical services to this vulnerable population navigating a pandemic, homelessness, violence, racism, and so many other traumas. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now call on Damian Samuels. Time starts now. Good afternoon and, and thank you to the Committee on Youth Services and to Chair Rose for allowing us the opportunity to speak. My name is Damian Samuels. I'm the Senior Director for Youth Services 
and community engagement at the Stanley Isaacs Neighborhood Center. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about uh, the real challenges that are facing young people, particularly young people of color. Um, as you know, the, this pandemic has exposed the fault lines in society. Um, many folks who were also already struggling, uh, this pandemic has exacerbated those challenges. Uh, a recent study, uh, the new strain of inequality, the economic impact of COVID-19 in New York City described how 68% of those who have experienced job loss are persons of color and one third of young adults age 18 to 24 have lost jobs during uh, this pandemic. Uh, one of the things that we often note is that people often mention that it's, it's critical that we get back to normal. Uh, it's important for us to, to mention that normal wasn't working for many uh, black and brown residents of this city before the pandemic. And so uh, restoring us to a time when it, things didn't work exactly well isn't exactly uh, a hopeful uh, outlook. And so what we need from the city council and the city is to prioritize innovative strategies to begin to be able to meet people's needs. Um, our young people, as you might imagine, um, have been really affected by the downturn in jobs in the hospitality industry and the retail industry to uh, industry sectors that have traditionally been very supportive of hiring young people. Um, one of the things that the Isaac Center did, we run a culinary training program. And so uh, faced with the prospects of having a, frankly, a hostile um, uh, job sector, we began to employ our young people in service of the food insecurity needs of our community. And so over the past six months, the Isaac Center has produced 18,000 meals for food insecure New Yorkers. Much of this work was driven by the graduates of our culinary training program. And so our pivot to finding uh, positions in health and wellness, as opposed to strictly culinary hospitality has been uh, really vital. Uh, but as you know, much of this work in ramping up our community kitchen was driven by one-time emergency philanthropic gift gifts. Uh, and while we certainly appreciate them, we know that the food insecurity needs of New Yorkers are not going away anytime soon. And so we need the city council to step up along with the city to advocate uh, for us to be able to provide increased funding to support community kitchen operations uh, combating food insecurity. Um, one of the other things that we found, it was a recent study um, by Burning Glass that spoke about the importance of finding lifeboat jobs. Uh, lifeboat jobs are jobs that provide short-term opportunities that connect people to uh, industries that do have some long-term growth. And so through innovative partnerships with New York Presbyterian, uh, through our pivot uh, and I'm health and wellness, we've been able to create this well, these, these kind of light bulb jobs. But it is critically essential that moving forward that we are thinking about how can we create greater opportunity for young people who we know if we don't deal with them now, we'll deal with the effects of our uh, ignoring of them later. And so the final thing that I just want to add and thank you to uh, Amy Wilkerson and also to Council Member Rosenthal for bringing up the indirect rate. Uh, we also were approved for uh, a greater indirect rate and, and obviously given the challenge of the pandemic that that program has been suspended. Uh, again, it is critically important to be able to restore this funding so that we can do the work that is so desperately needed. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Our next panel of public testimony in order of speaking will be Nargis Askar, Christine James McKenzie, David Calvert, and Chrissy Odelin. I will now call on Nargis Askar to, to testify. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Nargis Askar. I'm a student at the Dreams Youth Build Program. I'm glad that I have this opportunity with you all to share my experience with the Youth Build Program. Dreams Youth Build is an alternative school and vocational training program that helps students aged 17 to 24 to obtain high school equivalency diplomas, job skills, and help them to go on to college. The reason I joined the Youth Build program was because I hadn't finished high school, so I had no diploma. It was very hard for me to find somewhere to help me, to give me a second chance to start over and succeed this time. The program gave me a second chance to prepare me for taking the task exam and getting my high school equivalency diploma. The staff members, the teachers, the directors, it were beyond helpful. They helped me to start on a path of great success and a good future. Because of this program, I got my AHSC. The Youth Build program not only prepared me for getting my HSC, but helped me to improve my future, set my goals, and start on the path of achieving my dreams, on a path of making a difference. They also helped me to get on to college. I'm grateful for their contribution of the program towards not only the student's education, 
but towards the students' well-being, success, and goals. I believe the City Council should continue to fund the Youthful Program because the program is a person's second chance. How many times we have wished to have a second chance in life? I believe everyone deserves a second chance. This program was my second chance. It was what I needed to look forward to a bright and successful future. I want others just like me to know there's people out there that will welcome them and give them a second chance. That's why I believe they should be funded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now call on Christine James McKenzie. Time starts now. Good morning to the distinguished members of the City Council Committee on Youth Services. My name is Christine James McKenzie and I'm the Associate of Communications, Learning and Policy at Jobs First NYC, which is a nonprofit intermediary that creates and advances solutions that break down barriers and transform systems, supporting young adults in their communities in the pursuit of economic opportunities. Before I continue, I just wanted to say that I am continually impressed by how ably the young people have articulated their case for funding here today. New York City is facing one of the worst financial crises in its history and young people are the most vulnerable, bearing the brunt of the multifaceted displacement. Jobs First NYC intends to use all of the resources at its disposal to ensure that young adults are not disproportionately impacted by the recession and to assist our partners across the city but realize that none of us can go this road alone. It will require sustained focus and collective attention from all sides, including the city government, to give all young people a start that ensures success. Before COVID-19 gripped the country, the number of out of school, out of work 16 to 24 year olds was 117,000. Many of the same group were also likely to be employed in low wage jobs with limited opportunities for advancement. The Black and Latinx population were dis disproportionately likely to be disconnected and make up 56% of out-of-school, out-of-work young people. Early data on the impact of COVID on the out-of-school, out-of-work rates in New York City estimate 259,000 to 324,000 or 27 to 34% of all young adults that are not in school and are not working. To further evaluate the needs of out of school and out of work young people and pandemics early effects on workforce development, Jobs First NYC hosted a series of convenings in conjunction with youth and employment intermediaries, philanthropic institutions, workforce training providers and community college. The result is being cataloged in a working paper and the recommendations we have are such. The first one, design youth informed solutions that center young adults, their experiences and goals invest resources to decrease the number of out of school, out of work young adults. Recommendation two, create a seamless continuum of integrated supports across education and youth developmental stages and institutions. By that we mean fund mentorship program in mental health services as a standard part of youth workforce development programs. Recommendation three, build the capacity of workforce providers to deliver high quality, culturally competent, market aligned services to young adults, address job quality issues in the workforce development field through professional development and higher pay. Recommendation four, eliminate silos by encouraging and rewarding collaboration across youth workforce programs and providers. And number five, I'm expired. reinvigorate and expand partnerships with employers and industry groups to create employment and new career pathway opportunities. And the last, prioritize economic mobility and pathways to prosperity for historically marginalized and disproportionately harmed communities. We do appreciate the opportunities to testify and would like to continue to encourage our young people. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now call on David Calvert. Time starts now. Hello, uh, Chairwoman Rose. Hi, Debbie, and members of the Youth Services Committee. I am David Calvert. A moment ago, you heard from Nargis Asgar, a uh, Youth Build student from the DREAMS program in Brooklyn. Um, I'm speaking for the Youth Build NYC Collaborative on behalf of eight Youth Build programs located in all five boroughs and operated by some of the finest community service institutions in the city. Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation, New Settlement, Sobro, Antioch Community Services, Youth Action, Youth Build, Central Family Life Center, the HOPE Program, and Queens Community House. Each of these institutions has taken up the awesome challenge of turning 
around the lives of young people that really need that second chance through a methodology that includes training, education, counseling, community service, follow-up services, respect, inclusion, and yes, love. 10% of our population, 18 to 24, are in that slot. And one of them, one in six of that 10% are out of school and out of work. That's the population we address directly. They're often labeled opportunity youth because the upside of their transformation is to success. To success is so beneficial to our society and so deserved. And because with their vision and energy, so much good can be accomplished. With Youth Build over the past decades and across the country, over 200,000 opportunity youth have transformed their lives. They have constructed or rehabbed 40,000 units of low-income housing. They have contributed many millions of hours of service to their communities and have taken so many leadership positions in their cities and towns. New York City is the center for Youth Build and its birthplace 40 years ago, but our message and impact has, in effect, gone viral. This is an historic moment for the council, a chance to reverse last year's forced retrenchment and help ease the lingering shocks caused by the crushing pandemic, to build on the new spirit in Washington, D.C., made evident this week in the passage of the huge American Relief Act that will inject welcome fuel into our economy and expand the city budget directly by about $6 billion, to enlist youth who have been relegated to the margins into the rebuilding of their own lives and also of our city, both today and in the future. We request full and adequate funding for youth build in fiscal 22. Since 2014, the council has allocated 2.1 million of discretionary funds annually through a citywide speaker initiative, ensuring that no youth build opportunities are lost for lack of funds. Last year, the pandemic budget crisis caused a decrease. So a return this year to continuity funding would be 2.1 million citywide, but to ensure excellent youth build services for a minimum of 530 opportunity youth in all five boroughs, we respectfully request 3.2 million in the speaker's I'm citywide explained. initiative. We accept the challenges ahead, we're on it, and we need the council to join us with that. I will submit the full version of my testimony along with the written testimony of Audwin Green, a youth build graduate who went on to college at LIU and returned to join the staff as counselor for Youth Build Dreams in Brooklyn. Thank you for your attention and support. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Chrissy Odelin. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Rose and everyone on the call this afternoon. Um, my name is Chrissy O'Dallin and I serve as Senior Director of Youth Programs at New York Roadrunners. Thank you for this opportunity to testify before the Committee on Youth Services today. New York Roadrunners' mission is to help and inspire people through running. While we are best known for organizing the TCS New York City Marathon, our organization is one of the largest nonprofit providers of free youth fitness programs in New York City. Rising New York Roadrunners is the flagship youth program of NYRR and helps kids develop the ability, confidence, and desire to be physically active for life. The program takes a developmental approach to physical education, blending running and social emotional learning with a mix of fitness activities and games. Offer for free to New York City schools, after school programs, and community centers, we train teachers, counselors, and coaches to implement our youth program, as well as provide resources for virtual and blended teaching and reward kids to keep them moving and improving. We are asking the New York City Council to once again generously fund our critical services for youth under its physical education and fitness initiative, which will greatly help offset the expenses necessary in bringing our program at no cost to roughly 800 New York City educators and 100,000 students in every single city council district annually. In light of the COVID-19 crisis, New York City youth need more than ever an active lifestyle and resources that promote social emotional learning. Low levels of time spent being active cause a wide range of negative physical, social, and emotional health effects among youth. A lack of access to equipment, facilities, and spaces, unfortunately compounded by the COVID-19 crisis, and lack of support from peers and parents further compound these problems. To address the unique needs in the 2020-21 school year, we have enhanced our youth program's offerings to provide activities that fit a range of settings, whether students are learning in person, remotely, or a mix of both, and guide the inclusion of physical activity into students' days. The program also includes no barrier instructional videos, including Spanish language videos that can be followed independently at home. As a testament to our youth program's importance among New York City educators, in 2021, we were chosen as one of four providers to help New York City offer 
New York City schools offer high quality physical activities that focus on fun, movement, socially distant games, running, and sports conditioning through the CHAMPS program. We are also constantly working in partnership with the DOE and the Office of School Wellness Programs to adjust our curriculum to accommodate at-home learning and support educators transitioning to new teaching styles. The COVID-19 crisis has made NYR's work to support New York City schools, educators, parents, and kids more important than ever. Our youth programs is ready to serve every member of our community, regardless of the unique impacts COVID has had on our lives. I respectfully ask the City Council to reinforce the importance of keeping kids active by renewing and increasing funding under its physical education and fitness initiative so that NYR may continue at no cost to help youth across the five boroughs stay healthy. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. Our next panel of public testimony in order of speaking will be James Horton, Caroline Ioso, Adam Jacobs, Kenneth Jones, and Deborah Sue Lorenzen. I will now call on James Horton. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Rose and members of the committee and my fellow New Yorkers. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. I'm James C. Horton. Vice President of Education and Engagement at the Museum of the City of New York. The museum is one of 34 organizations within the CIG, Cultural Institutions Group, that are located on city-owned land or in city-owned buildings. Last year, CIGs welcomed nearly 24 million individuals uh, through their doors. We work in concert with many community partners to provide cultural, educational, and community services in a wide variety of ways. Our work has always been seen as vital to fostering a healthy, vibrant, equitable, and inclusive community. During the past year, we have found our work to be even that much more vital and necessary than ever as we deal with the challenges imposed by the pandemic, civil unrest, and economic challenges that so many New Yorkers are still facing. We work with all ages and all demographics all over the city. And now because of forced technological evolution, we can make our programs more available to New York City, more available to people all over the world. We are continue to be grateful for the council's support for culture and the arts in New York City and throughout the years that yields a monumental return on investment for all New Yorkers. And in this moment, this investment is more necessary than ever. I'm here today to provide information about some of the work that we've done with New York City's youth and advocating for funding the FY22 budget. During this past year, which was unlike any other in New York City's history, the Museum of the City of New York has still presented seven exhibitions that were offered in person and in many cases had virtual components. And in that virtual space, we managed to make the digital pivot, reimagining and expanding our work to serve thousands of adults, families, students, and educators through virtual field trips, adult learning initiatives, as well as youth and adult centered workshops expanding on exhibits such as Activist New York, which has a component that focuses on the movement for black lives and New York Responds, the first six months of the pandemic, which was a crowdsourced exhibition documenting how New York City responded to the events of 2020. In our upcoming citywide initiative, Project 846 will be a short crowdsourced documentary centering the voices of and reflections of New York City youth on the murder of George Floyd. This summer, we are looking forward to possibly being an SYP site and supporting the expanded vision for SYP by employing young people to support many of the museum's summer programs. While we've had significant amount of programming still happening both on site and the virtual space and plan to continue doing this to serve New York City through this hybrid model, We've also had a chance to take a different look at ourselves as a cultural institution, turning the mirror on our practices and continuing to explore how we can be a more equitable place and continue to uplift and amplify the voices of, men, of New Yorkers. Chair Rose, I leave you with one question today and a challenge to all of my esteemed CIG colleagues. What if all CIGs were mandated to be host sites for SYAP youth? What if all CIGs were mandated to be host sites for SYAP youth. Increase the budget and we'll make space for NYC's young people to work at New York City's cultural institutions. We ask that our budget remain harmless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now call on Caroline Ioso. Time starts now. 
Good afternoon. My name is Caroline Ayoso, and I am the Director of Advocacy and Strategic Communication at Opp Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow, OBT. Thank you so much to Chair Rose and the members of the Council for the opportunity to speak today. I am here to discuss the importance of centering young adults in the city's recovery efforts and for DYCD's budget to remain intact to facilitate this recovery. Founded in 1983, OBT is one of New York City's largest providers of workforce development and education services for opportunity youth ages 17 to 24 and adults who are disconnected from education and or employment. We exist to break the cycle of poverty and inequity through education, job training, and employment. We focus on meeting individuals where they are and work with them to meet their goals. As we know, COVID has taken a particularly devastating toll on New York City's young adults. Um, I've really, really appreciated, and I'm sure you all have as well, hearing from them today. That's um, really awesome. The pandemic has had a disproportionately negative impact on this population, and we must prioritize their needs and challenges in the, need, in the years to come and in this uh, coming budget. According to a uh, February 2021 report from the Center for New York City Affairs, young adults were 34% more likely to have lost work, and workers with a high school education or less were 16% more likely to have lost their jobs due to the pandemic. And in addition to bearing the brunt of the economic downturn, young adults also face an especially steep climb back to financial stability. This is due to increased competition for jobs, a need for enhanced skills, and the continued challenges and inevitable permanent changes faced by the service sectors. DYCD's programs must continue to be able to address this crisis and support young people in accessing living wage work. We advocate that their budget stays whole so that young adults of all ages can access enrichment and personal and professional growth throughout the year. After a stressful and difficult year for the city's young people, we must support them in building skills, connections, and community. And it would be cruel to cut funding to programs that engage one of the city's most vulnerable and most valuable populations. In particular, we at OBT advocate for programs like the following. Strengthening career pathways through expanding industry certified training programs. Um, we, for high school graduates or graduates of OBT's high school equivalency programs, we offer these advanced trainings in healthcare, construction, and technology. Um, and these programs create a bridge into growing sectors in the city. We also advocate for supporting those seeking their high school equivalency diplomas with increased digital education. A high school diploma is still the gatekeeper for living wage employment. And those without a diploma are relegated to lower paid and more vulnerable positions that lack opportunities for growth. Furthermore, we know that digital literacy and basic technological skills are essential for all workers. The pandemic has only- I mix by it. Um, as we determine the best paths forward, it would be devastating to leave young people, the next generation of doers, thinkers, and builders behind. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. And Chair Rose, thank you for your incredible advocacy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now call on Adam Jacobs. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Adam Jacobs, and I am representing the Youth Development Institute at Ramapo for Children. Uh, I'm here to share testimony from youth on the importance of youth leadership councils. They are our participants in our two youth uh, leadership councils, one which was already mentioned earlier today, my brother and sister's keeper youth council that we facilitate with DYCD, and the other from the youth council of the DOE Office of Community Schools. We think it's essential to have youth voices represent the needs of young people, but the council participants uh, are not able to attend this hearing because they have obligations for school and work. In the future, we ask that this committee consider moving the, afternoon, uh, the hearing to the afternoon uh, hours to enable young people to testify, uh, more young people to testify without missing school. Um, we also believe in compensating young, young leaders for their contributions. For this reason, the Youth Development Institute at Ramapo submitted discretionary requests to the city council to support our peer leadership and leader internship program, which would allow us to compensate youth leadership council alumni for their continued engagement and leadership after they have completed the one year council program. The councils explore important topics in New York City, such as policing, healthcare, equity and education, and more, and then make policy recommendations. Uh, as DYCD Commissioner Chung er, uh, mentioned earlier, the My Brother and Sisters Keeper Youth Council is lifting up youth voices through town halls. Uh, which are on YouTube and we will share. Um, and we were just tasked with uh, becoming peer hosts of circles for young people to discuss some of the stigmas associated with mental health challenges. 
the Office of Community Schools Young People are looking at the implications of student attendance and students living in temporary housing. Their testimonies are as follows. Adana 16 from Brooklyn says, I believe that being on a youth council is important. I'm the source that can be used to promote change, especially on the issues that directly affect me. Monica 15 from Queens, I'm passionate about my voice and this council gives me an opportunity to speak freely and competently about the things that matter most to me. Chloe 16 from Brooklyn, I'm an advocate for change and inclusion. I want to address the issues in my school and my community that others just walk by. Ryan, Ray Ann, 16 from Staten Island says, in my opinion, youth councils bring our youth community together, teach valuable life lessons and encourage the youth community to get along while voicing their opinion. Curvins, 21 from Brooklyn, the importance of having a youth council is that it gives young people the power to invest in themselves and improve their peers. It helps young people develop their leadership skills and also take on new skills along the way. It helps forge better adults for tomorrow because they are already in a line where they know how to be responsible and act according to a certain situation. Finally, Eva 17 from the Bronx says, the council makes me feel heard in a way that no other place does. Thank you on behalf of these youth leaders and everyone at the Youth Development Institute at Ramapo for Children. We look forward to working with you Time to continue youth leadership councils through renewed funding and to lift up the voices of young people in New York City. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Kenneth Jones. Time starts now. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, committee members. I appreciate you for your arguments. Um, so personally, I'm not an activist. Um, I am asking you to explain. Um, I think it's very important. But I wanted to share what I have Can we adjust this sound so we can hear him? Oops, sorry. Let's start his time again. Thank you. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. Time starts now. So, oh, so sorry. You've gone out. We can't hear you again. Oh, I don't know what's happening. Let it me might think. be the paper. That it might be the paper. Let me try. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I probably won't use all three minutes. So, um, thank you, Chair Rose, again, and the committee for taking time to listen to us. Um, why we're here to advocate for restoration of full funding. I'm not actually here to ask you for anything specific to the Salvadori Center, but I am here to share some research that we've done on the, valu the valuable impact that after school programs have on our city's youth. Uh, for those of you who don't know about the Salvadori Center, we've been working in the city for over about just about 50 years, uh, providing both push in programs for in school, kindergarten through 12th grade, as well as after school programs. We've partnered with DYCD over the years and in the last two years have worked with um, SYEPs on the Career Clue program. Before COVID, we were in the classrooms and uh, delivering direct services to students. But last summer, we did the entire Career Clue program online. <clears throat> All of Salvadori's programs are um, STEM programs that are tied to the built environment, and that's the buildings, the bridges, the parks, the playgrounds the real world that the students live in. And all of our programs are K through 12 grade specific programs. But the best part about the after school program is it really helps to close the achievement gap and the STEM gap for students from our city's most underserved communities. We have eight years of research that shows that when you do programs that are project-based where children build the programs with their hands, their experiments, they work collaboratively to solve problems. They learn how to communicate. They get an increased sense that they can succeed at STEM. They can see themselves as the city's future architects, engineers, builders, designers, developers. And they can see themselves as being successful in the school math and science that's relevant to their grade. And perhaps even more importantly, younger kids as early as fifth grade in kindergarten start to form their self-perception of their ability to be successful in math and science as early as kindergarten. And so when we have programs in the after-school environment for our most underserved communities, and especially programs that are accessible to them, hands-on and collaborative, where any student can succeed, they start to see themselves as part of the future of STEM, part of the future of the city, and, and breaking the cycle of oppression 
that has faced our communities for far too long. So programs like Salvadori are here to help. If you get money at the last minute, we have our own educators, our own curriculum, we can push into the programs and we can deliver those programs with two weeks notice. So we are here to applaud you, to thank you and to advocate with you for more funding for after school programs. Thank you very much, Chair Rose and the committee and sorry about the technical problems in the beginning. Not a problem. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Deborah Sue Lorenzen. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Sue Lorenzen, Director of Youth and Education at St. Nick's Alliance in North Brooklyn. We serve more than 6,000 youth and 3,000 adults through comprehensive youth services for ages 2 to 24. I want to begin my testimony by thanking City Council, who, with Chair Rose's stellar leadership, continue to fight with us for the critical youth services needed to help our children, teens, and families recover from this awful year. New York City's recovery will not happen without community-based organizations and our provision of comprehensive youth services. We are critical to helping turn around children's learning loss, providing the childcare that allows parents, especially single mothers of color, to get back to work and addressing socio-emotional needs of kids. For our youngest children, we need the Birth to Five Awards to be made whole and include the full scope of services requested by community-based organizations. St. Nick's Alliance did not receive a single extended day, extended year slot for our income eligible families, leaving low income families with three and four year olds to fend for themselves after 3 p.m. Further, we need our DOE contracts to cover the real costs of providing early child care education, as well as remove the 25% cap fringe benefits, which will not cover union pension. For our elementary and middle school children, we do need universal in-person after school and summer camp that allow for every child to have the enrichment and wellness supports essential to getting back on track in school. The annual fight for Sonic summer camp must end this year and the DOH, DOH clearance process must be unclogged as this obstacle is seriously compromising our ability to put people back to work and serve children and it has for over a year and a half. Summer camp cannot happen without DOE opening its buildings this summer. Last summer, not a single school was open in District 14 for summer camp. In order to plan effectively and meet the needs of our District 14 families, we need these decisions to be made now. For teens and young adults, we need the 25% cut to learning to work to be restored. Our LTW students are among the most vulnerable in the Department of Education. We cannot abandon them and leave them to join the, the ranks of one in five New York City students who drop out each year. And as one of the largest SOEP providers in New York City, St. Nick's Alliance is extremely grateful for Commissioner Chong and Assistant Commissioner Montanez's partnership as we each do our part to reach 70,000 youth this year. But the demand for SYP is much greater and we need universal SYP, even if implemented gradually. Process changes are also essential, beginning with 12 month contracts, because the three month, nine month contract Time expired. is absurdly burdensome and inefficient for providers and DYCD. I thank you for your kind attention. And again, thank you, Chair Rose, for all you've done for so many years. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. The final panel of public testimony in order of speaking will be Rachel Gazdick, Scott Daly, and Jone Billy. I will now call on Rachel Gazdick. Time starts now. Rachel? Hi, sorry, thank you. My name is Beth, actually, I'm Beth Reisman. I'm on the executive team at New York Edge. Thank you, Madam Chair, for your leadership on behalf of our city's youth and for the council's longstanding support of New York Edge. 
I'm here today on behalf of our fiscal year 22 city wide funding request of $1 million under the council's after school enrichment initiative. 29 years ago, New York Edge was created at the suggestion of New York City Council to provide free wraparound summer camps for youngsters attending summer school. From these beginnings, we have grown into the largest provider of after school and summer programming in New York City, traditionally serving over 40,000 students a year at 134 locations throughout the five boroughs. Our mission is to help bridge the opportunity gap faced by students in underinvested communities by providing programs designed to improve academic performance, health and wellness, self-confidence, and leadership skills for success in life. It is the belief of our board and staff that every child is gifted and talented if only given the necessary tools, resources, and supports. And as our name implies, we strive to provide every student in our programs with the edge that they need to succeed in the classroom and in their lives. 80% of principals attest to the power of New York Edge in supporting academic improvement in their schools, and 86% of parents believe that our programs are helping their children succeed in school. With your support, we received $850,000 in the FY21 budget. This funding allowed us to provide 3,000 youth from across the city with a mix of virtual and in-person summer camp activities last summer. Fiscal year 21 council citywide funding is also supporting our current after school programming. Currently we're running 107 programs, including seven learning labs throughout the five boroughs. And as the public school system resumes in-person instruction, more and more of our staff will return to the classroom. This year has brought us new collaborators and partners, including Teach Rock, founded by legendary guitarist Steven Van Zant, Mets on the Move, the US Olympic handball team, the New York Knicks, and actor and author Tay Diggs. New York Edge, its students and families are extraordinarily grateful for the support provided by the New York City Council these past 29 years. We are now looking to you to meet the needs of the next generation of young people by supporting our fiscal year 22 citywide funding request of $1 million, which will bring us back to our fiscal year 20 level of funding. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Scott Daly. Time begins. Okay. Good afternoon. Chair Rose and members of the committee. My name is Scott Daly and I'm the Senior Director of NYJTL, the New York Junior Tennis and Learning. You know us as New York Junior Tennis League. We've been in business for over 50 years. This year is our 50th year. Every year, because of the council's support, we're able to provide free tennis and traditionally reach over 85,000 kids citywide. We are in every borough, we are in every council district. And it's all as a result of the support that we get as we get funded under the Physical Education and Fitness Initiative. We've been partners for many, many years. Let me tell you a little bit about what, how many kids we, we hit. 70%, 70 percent of our kids are 10 years of age and younger. We have an equal distribution of 25% between African-Americans, Asians, and Latino. We reach across all low income family brackets. That's where we have our thrust. Our last year, it was right about this time when I was down there testifying on Friday the 13th at a hearing that really everything closed down. We run with the initiative money, $1.2 million we asked for, and we received $800,000. Costs have increased. We have been reduced to that number for the past 12 or 13 years. Primarily, I hope to, we, we hope to at least maintain and hold the $800,000. What do we do with it? We provide tennis free over four seasons of the year, from the winter, spring, outdoors, summer, and fall. 
In the winter, we have 20 weeks of indoor tennis throughout the city at eight different locations. That we, that's where we are now. We have extended our programming this year to the end of March. Right in the mid, middle of April, we're going to begin our outdoor season. Uh, the community tennis is open to everybody. Unlike other programs that the city may have it, um, funded and where people get involved, parents are most particularly amazed to hear that we're not an application. We are a registration, that they can come anytime. They are fearful that they're not gonna get their children to be able to participate. We take everybody in the community tennis. I spoke about the winter indoor program. We also provide school time tennis. We've been on suspension in this program, which as you, most of you already know, we teach gym teachers, anybody from a school, how to bring tennis into the school during the daytime hours. We provide curriculums. We provide the lesson plans for the teachers. We provide the equipment. We provide the training and extra staff members to go there and implement to bring the tennis in. We have intensive training. As I said, we have strict protocols. We going to be, we've added and we're going to continue to add extra staff members. We need the continued support of the city council. Again, we are asking for 1.2. Tennis transforms lives, as Arthur Ashe said, and that's what we do. We can't do it without your continued support. I am very grateful for all you do for the kids of the city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on. Thank you. Thank you. I will now call on John A. Billy. Hi, good afternoon. My name Time is. Begins. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Janae Billy and I serve as Director of Strategic Partnerships and External Affairs for PowerPlay. I will also be advocating on behalf of the Sports Training and Role Models for Success Citywide Girls Initiative, for which PowerPlay serves as the lead agency. I'd like to begin by thanking Chair Rose and the committee members for taking time today to hear our testimony and for their crucial leadership and support for our work in youth development. PowerPlay's mission is to advance the lives of girls through sports, helping them grow physically, emotionally, and academically stronger. Through our structured sports and social emotional learning based curriculums, we build girls' confidence and resilience and create safe spaces where girls learn from each other and from strong female role models. PowerPlay offers opportunities for girls where they would not otherwise exist, partnering with schools and community based organizations to conduct after school and summer programs emphasizing physical literacy, health and wellness, and leadership. Our work focuses on young women of color living in poverty who are among New York City's most vulnerable populations. Prior to the pandemic, there was already a call to action for increased funding for girls and women's causes, and the disparities exposed by COVID-19 has only reinforced the need for programs like PowerPlay because we know that when the virus restrictions lift, we will see an even greater demand for our programs and services. Furthermore, PowerPlay serves as the lead agency for the coalition of 10 New York City nonprofits known, known as the Sports Training and Role Models for Success Citywide Girls Initiative, Star CGI. As a collective, we support the healthy development of over 6,000 girls and GNC youth of color over, over, I'm sorry, overcome barriers to success and develop as leaders in their communities. Our partners, our 10 partners, PowerPlay, Girls Right Now, Groundswell Community Mural Project, the Low East Side Girls Club, Roe New York, Sadie Nash Leadership Project, the Armory Foundation, Figure Skating in Harlem, Girls for Gender Equity, and the Bella Abzug Leadership Institute continue to create thousands of programs, program slots and deepen programming for girls in all five boroughs. We all shared in the collective anxiety brought on by social unrest, racial injustice, the aftermath of a troubling election and a global pandemic but we also felt inspired by the many possibilities. In the midst of all the chaos emerged young people that are politically aware, that are activists for their communities and extremely vocal about the issues that are important to them. Star CGI remains steadfast in our mission to support and hold safe spaces for young women and GNCU to amplify their voices while engaging in important conversations with New York City Council members and other stakeholders on how to, be, how to best become an ally and champion for young people. The mental health needs of our young people have exploded during these tumultuous times. 
Star CGI has made it our mission to fill this gap, launching our hashtag Self-Care Saturday series, which includes engagements for youth to discover best practices to refill their own social emotional cups while elevating their voice on societal issues. We thank you. We need your advocacy to ensure our programs remain available by restoring our city council funding at $1.4 million in FY22. Once again, on behalf of girls and gender non-conforming youth in New York City, we thank you for your time um, and for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Before I turn to Chair Rose for questions, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate if they have a question for all our panels that have gone so far. Chair Rose. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I have no questions, just uh, two statements. Um, uh, when Nicole Hamilton testified, uh, she said that there, um, there was a deficit in terms of funding for SYEP. SYEP was fully uh, funded, um, all funding was restored. And, um, and I wanted um, Amy and, and uh, Damien um, who, and others uh, who spoke about um, the indirect rate that uh, we, we are speaking with OMB um, in regard to the indirect rate. Um, so I, I want people to know that we're fighting for all elements of this budget. Um, uh, and uh, I have no other questions. Do my colleagues have any questions? It does not appear that we have any questions or any hands okay. raised from other council members. So thank you, Chair Rose. Okay. Um, we have now heard from everyone that has signed up to testify. We appreciate everyone's time and presence. If we inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the raised hand function in Zoom and I will call on you in the order of hands raised. I'll just give everybody a moment to see if we have any hands raised. All right. Seeing no one else, I would like to note that written testimony, which will be reviewed in full by committee staff, may be submitted to the record up to 72 hours after the close of this hearing by emailing it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Rose, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. So, um, I would like to thank you very much, um, committee council, Amy Briggs. Uh, you did a great job for the thank first you. time. Um, oh. I, you, were, you were phenomenal, flawless. Um, and uh, I want to um, I want to thank all of you who um, who testified. Your your testimony was important and informative. Um, and I want you to know that we heard you um, and that we're going to be fighting for um, all of these issues that were brought forward today. And, and I want to thank uh, my stalwart uh, council member Chin for hanging in for the full range of this hearing, uh, along with uh, council member Riley. Um, uh, you're both phenomenal. And uh, I want to conclude with uh, the fact that we heard from our youth today. Um, we heard of the needs of, of the, um, the services that are uh, available, but um, we also heard of um, the value of these programs. Um, and, and I think that came across loud and clear that um, the services um, and the service providers um, provide great value to the youth of New York City. So um, I just want you to know that we, we must continue to fight until all, all, all youth in New York City have the same opportunity to achieve their goals by ensuring equal access to resources and only after we have achieved universal participation in youth services will we be able to eliminate economic and educational disparities in New York City. I wanna thank all of you again for your efforts on behalf of our youth 
and on behalf of our future. Uh, and with that, this hearing is now adjourned.